It's muted. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. What about now? Can anybody hear me now? Yeah, now it works. Okay. Good way. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Sorry for the technical glitches. Uh, we will catch up on time. No worries there. Um, let's see. Um, let, let, us, let me do just... If everybody can hear me okay, then I might just stay here. Um, okay, before we begin, uh, I'm going to... Uh, Show mode. I would just like to remind everybody about our code of conduct. About this is a hybrid meeting. Some of us are here at NCAR, a lot of you are online. And uh, please, when you give uh, feedback, be constructive, share the air with people when you speak, acknowledge teamwork in your presentation, encourage innovation, show appreciation, and consider new ideas. Um, this is the calendar for this morning. We're not going to have any sessions this afternoon. And uh, at the end of this morning, uh, we will adjourn and we will convene tomorrow for tomorrow, tomorrow morning for a joint session with the Product Climate Working Group. Um, so hopefully all the speakers for this morning, at least for the first half of this morning, uh, are here. And we are going to start with a quick update. And it's going to be presented by me, Kate, uh, Theo Calder, and, and Bill Lipscomb. And um, and before we do this, I just would like to acknowledge and thanks all the admin and multimedia team here at NCAR, Elizabeth Fairclass, Daniel Sena, Teresa Waltz, and Paul Martinez for all the help and coordination for this meeting to happen. And for the speakers, everybody has a 20-minute slot. This means try to uh, give your present presentation within 15 minutes and try to reserve the five last minutes for questions. And uh, with a further ado, uh, we are going to start with our first presentation, unless there is uh, any question from the group today. I don't see any. Then, all right, let's start with some land ice updates, and I will go first. <coughs> so, uh, Quickly, we wanted to bring you up to speed of what was going on here and what to expect within the next six months. Um, over, you know, by the summer, towards the end of this year, we're going to um, anchor and collaborators are hope for the, uh, hopeful to deliver CSM3 to the community. And season three will be, uh, in, will be coming into CSM3. And what you can expect from our end, from the Landice end, is a couple of new ice physics, a new carbon based sliding law, a flux written basal hydrology scheme that uh, Bill is going to talk a little bit about and after me. Some sub ice shelf cavity ocean uh, temperature and salinity interpolation when uh, you run with some ocean fields. Mountain glaciers, this is one of the greatest evolution um, for the land ice, when adding new capabilities to outside of the ice sheet realm. Um, and Bill is going to also talk about it. This is, uh, we have a postdoc, Sama Minella, who's uh, working uh, extensively on this. We're going to add new test cases uh, for Cheyenne and laptop for users to use uh, I toy uh, projects if they want to. And we are uh, we have revived the code validation diff kit that used to be uh, used back in the day and kind of set on the back burner for a while. And Michael Kelleher is going to tell us more about it. If time allow, we have a few other options that we'd like to bring in in terms of we're going to have like a new dynamical core, some new ice physics, some more mountain glacier um, capabilities. Um, on the cupping side, we, we would like to enable water isotope in season, but if it doesn't make it to this release, then I think we've survived. And some additional tools and data sets. So, what you have on the blue side of the panel is what you're going to have. On the turquoise side is if time allows. Um, in terms of coupling, up to now, you're, gonna, you, you're seeing this, uh, this little um, diagram on the left-hand side. You have blue arrows that are the coupling that are already, already available to the community. And this blue dot arrow is a coupling capability, but it's done offline, the coupling between the land ice and the atmosphere. Um, Kate is going to talk a little bit more about that and also some update on the land ice and land coupling. 
what's going to be new in CSM3, it's a fully coupling between land ice and ocean. Um, and I just want to be clear that what we're going to um, do for the CSM3 delivery uh, in terms of ice sheet ocean coupling is that um, the ocean is going to send the ice sheet, the temperature and salinity fields, and ice sheet is going to interpolate them under ice shelf cavities. So even though the new ice sheet, the new ocean model for CSM3 is going to be MOM6 and POP is going to be left as an option, we, even though MOM6 can do sub ice shelf cavity um, um, resolution, can resolve ice shelf cavities, uh, this is not going to be enabled right away, it, it will require some more work, but what we're going to do is still interpolate sanity and temperature in ice shelf cavities uh, for in CISM, and in return, uh, CISM is going to uh, send MOM ice shelf basal water fluxes to the surface layer of the ocean. The, the resolution of MOM6, what we're going to deliver is a two-third degree uh, ocean model, and later on, uh, we're going to try to tackle the quarter degree and uh, for full, fully coupled um, land ice ocean. Um, this is a three-person talk. Let's leave question at the end so we can move forward. And I will hand it out to Kate. Right. Uh, so I can just talk in yes. the room. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, someone will probably say something that doesn't uh, work out. Um, so. I am going to give some of the updates on the work that I've been doing as a software engineering liaison for the Land Ice Working Group. Um, some of this overlaps with the work that Bill and Gunter have been doing, but some of it's a little uh, separate. Um, one of the tools that we've been using for a long time to update the atmospheric lower boundary conditions um, when the glacier ice sheet changes over time is this offline ice sheet topography uh, tool. Um, and if you guys were at the meeting last month, um, there were some questions raised about how this is being maintained. So I recently moved it into its own GitHub repository, um, updated the documentation. You can see the readme there. Um, so this should cover the most recent libraries and shell systems on Cheyenne and uh, should be a fully working uh, documentation and code base for anybody who's interested in using this tool. And it does integrate the um, ice sheet topography with the CESM workflow, so it's somewhat automated, even though it's offline uh, between CESM runs. Um, so if you're doing a fully coupled simulation, this is a pretty awesome tool, and we're hoping that we can keep um, improving over time and integrating it closer with CESM um, over the next few years. Uh, one of the projects that I've started recently, so this is a slide from a co-chair's meeting uh, back in January, I believe, where they were working on starting up CSN3, coupled climate system testing, working on trying to reduce the lab seat uh, freezing, and tried some interesting things with the uh, snow start, the snow initial conditions in the land. And uh, discovered, you see down here on the left hand, that if you uh, push the system too far, the Offline glaciers that SISM no evolved will start to pull back water as a negative ice flux from the ocean. And this um, did not make the oceanographers very happy. The land people were um, admitted that this was kind of an awkward uh, response to the situation. Um, and basically, it's caused by the fact that SISM in non evolved mode needs to conserve water mass uh, within the ice sheet. But if you produce too much snow, uh, during the winter season, it's sent away as a solid flux, but then needs to be clawed back to balance the um, melting during the summer season. So we developed, well, Bill really developed an um, algorithm that will create reservoirs of ice to maintain that mass um, over the course of the year and slowly divvy it out into the columns that need it. Um, and then I've started working on uh, implementing this this spring. So, next slide, there you go. Uh, and a few other projects on the side, um, at the same time, I've been uh, working with the GHUB group. So there's a link there on the bottom left corner, the GHUB.org, which you guys should check out. Um, they host some CESM data. Um, I've been working with them on some website uh, cleanup, uh, working on developing ISMIT hosting capabilities and uh, integrating DOIs for uh, tools, data, and publications on the website. Um, 
And then we've started the land dice season diagnostics tools, which you can see the uh, GitHub repo over there. I was going to show like, you know, early stuff with the Python um, notebook and I couldn't get Jupyter Labs to load yesterday. So <laughs> this is the picture you get. <laughs> um, and there's actually, uh, so Brian Dobbins is the new head of software engineering working group for um, NCAR. And he is uh, really pushing hard to develop a uh, CGDY diagnostics integrated system. Um, and I'm trying to be a big part of that. So uh, that uh, we're kind of on hold waiting to see where that initiative goes. I actually asked him yesterday in the meeting uh, where we were with that. And he said that we should have something started by uh, like planned by the end of this week for meetings. Um, but we want to integrate um, groups in Sizzle who are doing a lot of this work already to make sure that they're on top of what we need as scientists and that the scientists are using all of the capabilities that are there and that everything works together in the end so we don't end up where we were with the last set of diagnostics packages, which was everybody made their own thing and none of it works together very well. So hopefully we won't have that happen again. <laughs> all right, uh, let's see. Last slide. So uh, lastly, we are getting a new supercomputer here at NCAR this year, Derecho is coming in. Um, and it's a bigger computer. It's about 1.3 times faster than Cheyenne, uh, node for node, but it's loaded with more nodes and a whole lot more GPU um, systems. So that should produce about three and a half times the scientific throughput of Cheyenne uh, if we can utilize all of the system. Uh, it should be available later this summer, they're saying like end of July for the community. Um, and then Cheyenne itself will be sunsetting throughout this year and will probably be taken offline sometime early next year. So uh, we can all look forward to some changes to our workflow due to this this year. Uh, there may be uh, one shared drive between Cheyenne and Duratio, but the file systems are so different that it's likely we'll all have to migrate our files from one machine to the other. So you guys can keep an eye out on the Sizzle Daily Bulletin, or um, I can add some information on the Land Ice uh, email server as it comes time so that everybody's updated on their workflow. That's all I got. <laughs> oh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to spend the remaining time talking about a couple of um, ongoing model development in SISM. Uh, these are things I've talked about in previous meetings, but we've been trying to move both forward to the point where we can publish and make these more operational. Uh, I'm first going to talk about uh, SISM's new basal hydrology scheme, and I'm going to try to walk you through the motivation and the basics of how it works in about 10 minutes. And then I'm going to uh, give you an update on the mountain glacier evolution work that's being led by Summer Manala uh, with help from Gunter and me and a couple of outside collaborators. Uh, so, the first question is, uh, if, if you're interested in large-scale ice flow evolution of the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets, uh, why would you want a, a basal hydrology model? Um, it sort of goes to the, your basal sliding law, if you have a sliding law that has Coulomb behavior in some regime. Um, by Coulomb behavior, I mean that, uh, so I've written an equation describing the zoot iverson law, which we've been using in SISM recently. Um, tau is the basal shear stress. And we write that as a product of three terms. Um, N is the effective pressure, which is the difference between the ice overburden pressure, the weight of the ice, and the water pressure, which par partially supports the ice. And then there's a uh, Coulomb factor, uh, Coulomb C, which says something about the geology of the region, whether the, the, the till or the, the base of the ice is, is softer or harder, more or less resistance to flow, and then a the velocity dependent factor. And the way this factor is written is that UB is the basal velocity and UT is a constant. So the limit of large UB, fast sliding, this term goes to one. And the basal stress is determined by the product of these two terms, the effective pressure and, and the Coulomb term. So the effective pressure, as I said, is the difference between the, the weight of the ice and the water pressure at the bed. And <clears throat> all the, the physics and the complications and the math are in the water pressure here. So there's two approaches we've generally used to figure out uh, what N and Coulomb C are. Uh, one thing you can do is you can just kind of set N equal to overburden, um, ignoring any complications with water, and put all the complications in the Coulomb C factor, and then invert for that factor. 
Um, that's we've done something similar to that for a lot of our ISMIP six runs, and you get a really good uh, uh, thickness and velocity field that matches observations well. Um, the only thing is you tune this Coulomb factor at every vertex, and you've hidden all the physics in that factor. So another approach, which is more physical, which might be the approach you, you want to use if you're doing a long scale <coughs> uh, long scale simulation where you don't want to prescribe every the, the nature of the bed for all time is use a hydrology model to compute the water pressure. And once you have the water pressure, you have the effective pressure in, and you plug into your in into your sliding line, you're done. So the, the so the main goal of the hydro hydrology model it, with this sort of motivation is, is to compute that water pressure and the resulting effective pressure. So <clears throat> the, the the thought is, can we write a simple basal hydrology model? Um, something that's computationally cheap, numerically robust, and conserves water that will do the job well enough for us without get, getting into um, complications that might be not needed for, for what we're wanting to do scientifically with, with SISM and CESF. So I'm going to describe the model in a nutshell. We say everything's in steady state, meaning that um, that doesn't mean the water system doesn't evolve, but it means at a given time, everything is a function of the ice sheet geometry at that time. Uh, so, so you basically diagnose it from the state of the ice. <clears throat> and the basic idea is you have melt water wherever you have melting at the bed, and the melt water flows downhill, where by downhill I mean down the hydro potential, uh, don't know by phi. Um, and the hydro potential has basically two terms. It has a term proportional to the elevation of the bed, and another term uh, that's proportional to, or is equal to the water pressure. And the key simplification is that we've set the water pressure equal to uh, the overburden pressure of the ice for purposes of this calculation. So we're ignoring N um, for purposes of hydrology, although it comes back into play in the dynamics. Uh, so we say the speed of the water is proportional to the gradient of the hydro potential. And <clears throat> we're able in steady state to compute the flux through every grid cell, basically just by starting at the top at the highest hydro potential and counting our way down and add in water sources as they arrive. So that gives you the steady state fluxes. Uh, you have the speed, um, and that gives you the water depth. And then the last assumption is you assume that uh, uh, given the water depth, you can compute the fraction of overburden, which is held up by the water pressure, somewhere between zero and one. And you say that when there's no water there, uh, <clears throat> the fraction is close to zero. And when you say there's a, when there's a lot of water there or, or large large depth, you say that um, uh, the water pressure is close to overburden. In other words, this fraction is close to one. Um, <clears throat> so this is it's not that many lines of code. Um, it's not that expensive. And when you do that for Antarctica, this is what you get, where the yellow shows your major ice streams, uh, which actually line up really nicely with the observed ice streams, Thwaites, Pine Island, blowing into Filtzner flowing into Ross, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and given, the, given that uh, water depth, the question then is what velocity field do you get uh, when you use your basic slider, basal sliding law in your full velocity scheme? So <clears throat> this is, on the left, the observed pattern of velocity in Antarctica. Uh, the white spaces are just missing data. And this, on the right, is what we get simulated in an Antarctic spin-up. And if you take a, <clears throat> just a general look, you can see that almost all the ice streams in Antarctica are in the right location, and most of them are at more or less the right speed. So, so that looks great. On the other hand, if you look a little more closely, you'll see, for example, along the Cycle Coast, these ice streams flowing into the Ross Ice Shelf. You have these very developed um, ice streams with, with strong ice streams with tributaries. But if you look over the simulation side, you see these are too weak. Um, and, and the issue that, that I'm finding is that <clears throat> if the scheme is tuned pretty well for most of the ice streams in Antarctica, uh, the cycle coast is too weak. So I, I think it needs some sort of um, re basin specific tuning to get the cycle coast right, and maybe a couple of other regions. But I think with that tuning, this is going to work uh, pretty well. So, so the next steps in this would be to uh, do a little more tuning to better match the observed thickness. The tuning would not be at the grid cell level, but more at the basin scale level. Uh, we want to uh, see how much better is better this is than the local basal till model we've been using for Greenland up until now, and, and then apply to some long-term Greenland and Antarctic simulations. 
Um, and Sarah Bradley has been a pioneer in using this scheme um, as applied to North American ice sheets at the time of the last glacial maximum. So then I, I wanted to spend the remaining time talking about mountain glaciers and SISM. Um, as you may have heard, we've started using SISM not just as an ice sheet model, but as a glacier model. Um, the goal is to simulate <clears throat> most or perhaps all of the uh, Earth's 200,000 glaciers um, so that we can use this model to help predict the evolution of glaciers. Uh, there's lots of groups doing this, but so far we're the only group that's tr at least trying to do this um, with a, a full three-dimensional uh, dynamic model rather than a, a simpler model. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we've done so far is created a grid applying to high mountain Asia, the region illustrated on the left here, uh, which has close to 100,000 glaciers. And for test pur purposes, because the, the whole region is, is expensive to run, we're just focusing on the Everest region for now, and then we want to look at the Karakoram region. So, so the idea is you initialize with observed glacier outlines from the Randolph Glacier Inventory, and you get the ice thickness, or at least for now, we're getting this from um, consensus ice thickness estimates from a paper by Farinotti et al. And the forcing comes from a data set called ISIMIP, which is a bias corrected historical forcing that includes monthly mean snowfall and surface temperature uh, derived from that data set. So, so we're using a, a degree day sort of approach to compute the surface mass balance for each glacier. So, <clears throat> The idea is to spin up to as realistic a, a state as we can before we start applying climate warming and looking at a future evolution. So the way the spin up works, uh, we're using a depth integrated solver, which has very good numerical properties at high resolution. Uh, we're running at 100 to 200 meters typically. Uh, we have a power law coefficient uh, and a basal sliding law that we tune to try to match our thickness target. And then we also have uh, a coefficient called mu star. Um, this is from the terminology developed by the OGGM, the Open uh, Global Glacier Model. And in that scheme, the monthly mean surface mass balance is given by the difference between the incoming snowfall and the ablation. And the ablation is parameterized as a function of the difference between the temperature and some temperature uh, near zero, typically a little below zero, um, multiplied by this tuning parameter mu star, which we tune separately for each glacier. And <clears throat> broadly speaking, the spin up looks good. Uh, these are the initial uh, glacier outlines overlaid on the, uh, the surface elevation, which comes from a DEM. Uh, these are the ice speeds, and the ice speeds are of roughly the right magnitude and fast, fast in the places we expect compared to the observations that exist. Uh, and then the simulated ice thickness, uh, thanks to some of the tuning we do, ends up looking not too different from uh, the initialized from our thickness targets, although uh, we tend to have large biases in the glacier termini where the, maybe we're not doing the surface mass balance as accurately as, as we'd like. Um, so far, so good, but as always, there's challenges that come up, and sometimes not the, the challenge isn't necessarily what you thought it would be. So <clears throat> the, the fundamental question is how you choose this parameter mu star, how you constrain it with observations. Because the sensitivity of the glaciers in a future climate is um, just about directly proportional to the value of mu star for that glacier. So the approach we started with is we have this great data set from Huguenay et al. 2021, uh, who observed the surface mass balance of glaciers averaged over the last two decades uh, pretty much everywhere. So <clears throat> given that surface mass balance averaged over the last couple of decades, uh, we can choose mu star to match that target. Uh, the issue is that for, for spin-up, we want to have glaciers that are roughly in steady state, and most glaciers are now uh, retreating. So we have to apply a cooling factor to get the glacier in a steady state. And the thing is, it happens that our cooling factor is so big that we think we're overestimating the sensitivity of the glaciers. So <clears throat> uh, possibly that means the data set is, uh, has some biases, or possibly our method, we just haven't worked all the kinks out yet. So, so the second method we're trying is we're forcing the glacier with 20th century temperature and snowfall. And assuming the glacier was in balance during that time, meaning its surface mass balance was zero <coughs> over, over its extent. So we can use that method to develop, to choose mu star. Um, it seems to give more sensible values, but it's just that we're no longer constrained by these observations that we thought were gonna be really helpful. So the next step would be to apply these methods to the Alps in Europe 
uh, where we have better uh, observations because training what we're doing. And also, uh, uh, Summer and Gunter and I are going to be talking with Harry and Fabian uh, next week uh, to see if they have any thoughts or ideas for, for the best way to do this. Uh, so that's what I have. And uh, just finished by posting the contact information. Um, Marin and Gunter are now the co-chairs, and Gunter and Kate are the liaisons. And, and we have another session tomorrow that we hope you'll join us for that as well. Uh, I'll now pass it back over to Gunter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we have now time for question, and, and I saw a question in the chat, and if you if you don't feel too shy, you can unmute yourself and uh, and ask a question so everybody could hear it. Uh, all right. Can you go ahead? Uh, I can. Oh, okay. Sorry. Let, let's 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 have you can hear me first. actually. Yes. Yeah. So I was, I'm really impressed by the advances in the model, especially for high resolution things. And Bill said, do you use a full 3D model? Do you use full Stokes then? Or the same plotter plotting you use in CESM? Like you use the exact same CESM. This is a question. Oh. So, so the question is, do we use the same dynamics solver for the for the glaciers as we do for ice sheets? Yes. Uh, yes, we do. We're using this depth integrated solver, also known as DIVA, where we solve we solve the elliptic equation for velocity in two dimensions, and, and then we integrate through each column to, to get the full 3D velocity field. So, so it's simpler and more efficient than bladder patine, but gets pretty close to the same answer as bladder patine in, in most places. Okay. Uh, so so it's, it's a nice middle ground between shallow ice and, and full stokes. Right, so it looks really good for that for the Asian glaciers. That yeah, does, yeah, it's yeah. kind of so, yeah. su surprising how well it worked right off the bat. Right. Well, that's good. It probably looks good for Alaskan glaciers then too. We hope so. Yeah. Um, Alaska <laughs> marine terminating glaciers we we haven't done yet, so we have to put some thought into how to handle the the calving front of marine glaciers non-carving ones like bearing glacier i mean it sort of has these puddles and lakes right you don't it, need anyway to go, face. we it's you true. and i should talk about how we how we yeah, handle those. A ton of validation data yeah. no it it looks really good i was quite impressed yeah, thank you all right uh can could you have your hands up go ahead uh yeah if you can hear me um i have a question for that last talk about you were talking about the challenge of getting the steady state behavior of glaciers and you were using the 1950 to 70 as a sort of standard um, period where you were having steady state i was wondering whether you could use the little ice age extents because there is now a lot of people that have published these open access data sets of moraines for the himalayas i know jonathan karavik's team in leeds is doing a lot of that but also for periphery glaciers in greenland um, and i guess the little ice age maximum extent is a moment in time where we actually know that Glaciers were likely in equilibrium with climate because you have these big advances. So I was wondering whether that's something you could consider in terms of modeling that to tune your Muir star parameter um, and check that against observations. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting idea. We we haven't talked about it. Oh, I, we can talk about it with Summer. But a question for you would be: Is there something like the RGI outlines where they've mapped the uh, what they think was the little ice age extent for every glacier? Yes, yeah, so the way that Jonathan Garrick's team work in Leeds, they, they've taken the RGI outlines and they've extended them to match the trim lines on the moraines from the Little Ice Age. Uh -huh, and then okay. they have an algorithm that creates an ablation area surface from that. They measure the, the thickness difference between that and their DM that gives us the ablation area volume uh, loss since the Little Ice Age. But you could potentially get those outlines um, to check against your model ice extent automatically all these mountain glaciers um, uh, that, 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 yeah that's a great suggestion so we'll, we'll talk about that with summer thank you cool. yeah tom go ahead all right i i have a question for bill about the uh, mountain glacier simulations so uh so currently so so do you uh, do a simulation so uh, simulate all the glaciers as a whole or 
uh, simulate the glaciers uh, one by one. Ah, um, from the point of view of the system dynamic solver, we're simulating all of them as a whole. So we're solving one set of dynamic equations for all the ice on the grid. Uh, so if two glaciers happen to be right next to each other, they will dynamically influence each other and, and all that. Um, from the point of view of mu star, we treat every glacier independently. So every glacier has its own tuning factor. Uh, and then for, for diagnostic purposes, we'll, we'll aggregate things over glaciers. But, but I would say that basically we treat everything as a whole except for this glacier specific parameter mu star. Okay, so how, how do you uh, do the uh, mesh gridding? Because, you know, the mountain glacier is so small that how do you, uh, how do you uh, uh, cope with the, the gridding issue? Because we need to, uh, we need to get a pretty uh, very fine, um, fine mesh around the glacier edges, uh, outlines. Um. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if this is going to answer your question, but uh, every grid cell has a label attached to it, which is its glacier ID number. Uh, and if there's no glacier there, it has ID zero. And we have some logic in the code that makes sure that each cell has that's ice covered is attached to one and only one glacier. So, so that's is, is that part of what you're asking about? Oh, uh, sorry. Maybe I, I didn't make myself clear. I mean, I mean. Uh, so the the mountain glacier is, is very small right so uh how do you do meshing uh is, is it kind of a uniform mesh or is kind of a, a final oh. element um, sorry mesh? sorry yeah it's it's a, it's it's a uniform square mesh as we typically use sism with mm -hmm. and at 200 meters oh. we, we we miss some small glaciers uh, there are a few glaciers that just uh go away between the rgi outlines and and the initial grid uh, but we just hope that it's not, it's small glaciers, so not so important for mass balance. Um, if we go to 100 meters, then we catch more of those glaciers. And, uh, but, 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 but definitely there are some, we, we have some approximations and we have some diffusion around the edges. Uh, so, so we're not doing as good a job on the smaller glaciers as we can do with the larger glaciers, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and happy happy to follow up with you later. All right, thank you for the for the questions. Let's move on to our next talk. Um, Michael Kelleher is going to talk to us about verifying and validating SISM with a LiftKit experience. So, Michael, if you don't mind um, get, entering your presentation mode and share your share your slides, the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Gunter. Uh, let me get the slides up here. Can everybody hear me? Hopefully. Oh dear. Yes. Yeah, we can hear um, Apologies. Uh, PowerPoint seems to be having a bit of an issue here. I also have your presentation if you'd like me to, to present your slides, if it works best. Um, I, have a, I have a PF. Hopefully that can... Uh, Solve our problem here. Yeah, maybe it's best if you share slides. I've lost the lost the ability to uh, to share my screen. Okay. Okay. 
getting there, getting there. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> uh, it's a PDF, so I think we're going to have to do it this way. If it works for everybody. And just tell me how to, when to advance. All right. Thanks, Hunter. So thanks, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I'm Mike Kelleher. I'm a research software engineer at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, and I've been working on, on this a uh, bit of the project for you know a couple of months now, so obviously a complete and total expert on this. Um, so I want to talk to you about validating, verifying CSC SISM, uh, and what we're calling the LiveKit experience. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide here. So <clears throat> we talk about validation and verification. Uh, what is it that we're talking about? We want because numerical models are inherently imperfect, and that includes IT models, we want to ensure that we're using the best possible representation of the real fix. So we do that through answering a couple of different questions. Uh, the first is uh, answering, are we solving the equations correctly? And this is inherently a math problem. Essentially, hand our numerical model a uh, analytic problem and see how well it approximates that. Uh, that analytic solution that we know of. And the next is code verification, which is a engineering problem. Did we build what we wanted? Does the code do exactly what we say or what, what we think it should do? Then there's physical validation, which is a physics problem. Are we using the right physics? And that's a question for um, the gladiologists and the physicists and all of that. There's performance validation. Did we build what our users wanted? And this is a design question. And that is, um, is our ice sheet model or numerical model, is it useful to the people that need to use it for research? Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so to do that, the Land Ice Validation and Verification Toolkit was developed, or LiveKit. It's a Python-based open source validation and verification toolkit for land ice numerical models. It's available on GitHub. Uh, it was originally developed through the Pisces DOE SIDAC project. And essentially, the, the take home is that it performs a variety of checks on two different runs of a numerical ice sheet model. In this case, it works on SISM. The easiest way to get it to work on SISM is to run some regression tests, uh, which then it, it runs a suite of tests and then organizes the output into a structure that, that LiveKit can understand. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so what does LiveKit need? The, the first thing is model data, obviously. Uh, what else does it need? Uh, so as a note, this is not intended to be a, a full-on tutorial of exactly how you install LiveKit. Um, the, the information about that is available on our, uh, both the GitHub repository, which is linked in the, in the PDF and the um, documentation website as well. So it's the easiest way is you have a, an Anaconda environment or Mamba environment, which is specific to running LiveKit. Once you have that environment set up, because LiveKit is available on both ContaForge and uh, the Python package index, it can be installed with either pip install LiveKit or, or Mamba install LiveKit. Um, and it only has a few dependencies as part of the design philosophy of being uh, lightweight and extensible. Um, so there's our generic NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, et cetera, um, for reading and processing the data, and then there's a few other libraries that are for generating the reports. Um, the full detailed instructions, like I said, are on our, our GitHub and the documentation website as well. Next slide, please. So once you have it installed, what do you need to do? Um, so built-in LiveKit has, um, has the ability to analyze uh, SISM output. Um, but essentially, it uses JSON configuration files to 
specify the variables that that you would like to examine, the location of the data relative to your you know top level directory, and importantly, a description of the tests that you have run. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what tests uh, are run through SISM uh, in, a, in a moment, but uh, this this description populates the output report, and it it allows people like me who aren't um, uh, I'm not an ice sheet modeler. I, I don't really know what these tests do, but being able to have these uh, descriptions allows somebody like me to to kind of at least get somewhat of an understanding of what these tests. So it, it lives alongside uh, it lives alongside the output. The LiveKit API has four primary modules, and that's um, the there are the bundles, the components and the, the scheduler. So the, the thing that's the most relevant, I think, to you folks is um, is the the bundles. And that's that's kind of the the model specific uh, information. Um, so that has all of the all of the tools and scripts and configuration files for processing a particular model how to process the, um, say the net CDF output, how to process the log files, read the configuration files, so you can compare those across different runs. Um, but that's, that is an encapsula encapsulation of a particular ice sheet model. So there's one for SISM, there'll be one for Molly, bicycles, et cetera. <clears throat> um, then there's the components module, this is the the generic uh, scripts that handle the analysis, the validation, verification, numerics, performance, all of that, and puts those into the report. The scheduler is what runs all of these analyses in, in parallel, combines them, and generates the report. And then the utilities are the non-model specific utilities um, so it has has information for how the report is designed how it looks uh, when you generate a website um, kind of other other methods for generic data io and that sort of thing um, and this this diagram kind of kind of shows all of the um, the main uh, modules as well as the extensions in that in that purple uh, box where LiveKit is able to be extended to other types of analyses, not just um, the, the specific validation and verification that's built in. Um, and that's all detailed in, in Joe Kennedy's paper from 2017. Uh, next slide, please. So I mentioned the build and test suite, the regression suite, so what is BATS and how does it run? So like the other single test cases, it's a, a Python script. And in this SISM test regression directory uh, on the, uh, the SISM repository, there's a few scripts available to set up your <laughs> HPC environment for uh, computers like Cheyenne and um, uh, just Cheyenne, actually. Um, the other the other setup scripts are for computers that have been retired, I think. Um, so it can be the the build and test suite can be invoked through this build and test.py Python script. Uh, there's a, a few command line options. Again, this is not intended to be a full on tutorial of, of how to use this, just to introduce the tools. Um, so that you specify the platform and the compiler together, like Cheyenne Intel and add any additional arguments for running the performance suite, um, specifying the build and output directories, that sort of thing. All of that's available. Uh, the, the information of it, uh, on that is available through the, uh, the help command line option on that. Um, this Python script generates one or more batch scripts, which right now must be submitted manually. You submit those manually, it runs the test and um, it runs it, it runs this suite of tests and organizes all of the output for you. 
Uh, next slide, please. So what all is run when you run bats? So by default on an HPC system, uh, so this the build and test suite can be can be run on you know, a local workstation as well. Uh, but on an HPC system, it it runs the performance suite by default. Uh, so you can get an idea of if your code changes have have regressed the performance um, or improved it, hopefully. Um, so by default, it runs a few of the ISMIP POM cases uh, at a couple of different scales, and then some idealized cases. The, the DOME test case is sp used specifically for um, a number of different uh, domain sizes and processor counts to obtain the, the strong and weak scaling uh, for the performance, uh, as well as obviously analyzing it for um, the the output. And then the circular confined shelf and, and stream test case are also run. Uh, next slide, please. When when we have uh, the BATS suite, it has you've You've run it once, and then you've made some changes to the model, and you've run it again. Now you have two different directories, uh, your test and your reference. Um, LiveKit expects the output from these tests to be in a particular directory structure. And I've done a little diagram here at, at the right-hand side. So it starts with the bundle name. I, I mentioned the, the bundle, so that each bundle um, his name for the model and dynamic core, so in this case, Sism Glissade, is, is the top-level directory name. Um, and above that, you, you want to have, uh, the say, the version or branch of the model that you've run. Um, but underneath that top-level directory is a metadata directory, your job scripts and all of that, um, the, that you've used to generate these, these test output. Um, and then for each test category, there's another top level directory. So for dome, ismipom, stream, etc. Underneath that is the the variant for say ismipom A, C, F. If the test doesn't have a variant like dome, uh, it's just another directory called dome. And then the number of processors that you've run on, the resolution, and the domain size. Um, so once you have your test output, BATS automatically does this. Um, once you have the, the output from BATS or, or a simpler test suite, LIV is just invoked with LIV and then the command, uh, the, the command line option verify. And I've, I've used two environment variables, test and ref. And that, again, points to the bundle name directory. So that's how LIVKit knows what bundle to run. So this, this output is from Sism Glissade. Uh, so we're going to run the Sism Glissade bundle in LiveKit. And it's going to know where all of the log files are, how they look. And it's going to know how the output files uh, are, are shaped and all of that stuff. Uh, next slide, please. So LiveKit generates uh, a nice little output web page. And here we've done a comparison of the, the present SISM main branch to Gunther's update towards SISM 3 branch. Um, on top of his changes, I've made a couple of minor modifications to allow the, the GPTL timers to, to work. Uh, so we get more detailed performance statistics. And then a few infrastructure changes just so that um, everything submits to Cheyenne correctly. So we run LiveKit. It generates this output web page uh, or a, a whole set of output web pages. Um, you can see it at, on the on the right hand side. There's um, this is the the landing page. It has some navigation on the left with the different tests, uh, the the different tests that were run, and then a summary. You can know how your model is uh, comparing with the previous branch. Maybe you want it to be bit for bit. Maybe you don't. Uh, maybe you have cha changed it in a way that should make it better and they shouldn't be bit for bit. Um, so that whether whether these numbers are good is is you know up to up to the user. So this 
this output web page can be served locally with live s that's an, a non-production web server it's just the the built-in python uh, web server you you can serve this to your local machine or in this case we've published the results to github pages um and it's available there at that at that link uh for a few different um for a few different cases next slide please and, and michael uh, this is a two-minute warning okay um so yeah this this is the actual the, the comparison of the um of the two different cases that we have uh most of the tests are bit for bit ismipom has some minor on the order of 10 to the minus 11 differences in the velocity field uh mostly at the boundaries uh but overall they compare pretty well uh next slide please and the, the performance also compares really well um it's it's nearly the same there's a minor speed up say this this is the 124 squared domain size on 256 cores um i i think we're you know we're probably not uh you know, counting this this tenth of a second on a seven second runtime that's that's probably not significant, but um, but hey, we like we like to see every, every second counts. Um, but the the performance stacks up well, and this this is an example of the performance output that you get, um, where the uh, it's broken down by by category, um, uh, of where where the time is is spent. Uh, next slide, please. So. This is kind of the initial uh, reviving of, of LiftKit to be able to run on SISM. Um, where do we where do we go from here? We want to make some improvements to LiftKit. I'd like to make some tweaks to the landing page, make it a little bit more informative. Uh, some something that we can see um, very quickly how how our two model runs compare. There's some backend coding improvements that can be made. We also would like to handle any user requests, and the best way to do that is through our GitHub issues page, uh, or I, I believe our emails are still listed on on um, on the GitHub page as well. Um, and then there's also improvements to bats that can be made. The overall structure we can maybe tweak to add or remove regression tests. Um, you know, run perhaps a different suite of regression tests. Um, other than the default one more easily. Um, and also building the model, the B part is tied to the SISM repository build. We may eventually want to make this separate so that um, perhaps if a new supercomputer is is added, we can uh, still run an old version um, on this new supercomputer uh, without being tied back to, to a particular version of, uh, of BATS. Uh, next slide, please. I want to wrap up, just introduce the rest of the LiveKit family of software. So I mentioned that LiveKit is supposed to be extensible. Um, and so the LiveKit itself is for validation and verification of ice sheet models, but it's also the flagship it's used to run most of the other family members, including Lex, which allows us to validate against uh, observations um, or um, reanalyses or other models. Uh, the dashboard runs a nightly test suite for right now for Molly and Bicycles as part of the E3SM project uh, and reports those results to C Dash. And then there's also Eve for ESM, which is the extended validation and verification for Earth system models. And this performs statistical testing of Earth system models. Uh, right now, it works for uh, the atmosphere component of E3SM as well as um, in the testing phase of. Uh, Having it working for the ocean component and pass ocean, uh, this also acts as a as a LiveKit extension. Uh, so thanks for your time. I'll I'll take any questions uh, if there's time. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah. So while we switch uh, presenter, if anybody has a question for Michael, please go ahead and mute yourself. Can I ask a question? Of course. Thanks for the great presentation, Michael. Uh, I have a question. Back in the lead up to SMIP 6, we worked with Joe on an atlas, meaning like a graphical standard output running for SMIP type of uh, ice sheet model output. Is that still something you're developing, or has that kind of disappeared? 
Uh, we haven't been developing that at all. Um, at least not as I I haven't been. So uh, uh, I don't I don't know if Joe I don't think Joe has continued that work uh, in his new position. But yeah. All right. In in the interest of time, let's move on. Uh, Tong Zhang is next. Um, and thank you for staying up so late. It's past midnight <laughs> where you are. <laughs> And Tang is going to present us about uh, geothermal heat flow basal boundary condition during green and ice sheet spin up. So if you can share your screen, go ahead. I have your presentation downloaded if you need to. Right, so can you see my screen? You can see it, yes. Oh. Um, okay, so um, okay, so thank you. I want to thank um, Gunter for this great uh, great chance to present our work on Greenland ice sheet modeling. So uh, this work is about the geothermal heat flow uh, based on boundary conditions during uh, Greenland ice sheet spin up, and uh, it's it's kind of a, a international collaboration work. And I'm from the uh, Beijing Normal University. So. Uh, uh, as we all know that the the, uh, the green ice sheet can impact the sea level rise uh, a lot and uh, uh, many groups have done uh, a, lot, a lot of works to understand the future changes of uh, the green and ice sheet uh, but unfortunately according to the um, the most recent uh, is six results the model uncertainty is still quite large and uh, we we want to try to uh, to understand further uh, where the uh, un uncertainty uh, come from. Uh, if we look at the ice sheet model uh, procedures, we, uh, we know the ice sheet model can uh, will solve three kind of uh, three different types of uh, equations. The, the energy balance equations, the mass balance equations, and the force balance equations, and each equations have two uh, boundary conditions uh, at the surface and uh, also add as a bad. And in this study, we uh, just want to focus uh, one of them, uh, uh, one of the uh, conditions, uh, uh, which is the normal condition. So from the previous study, like the uh, McGregor paper, uh, we know that uh, around 40% of the uh, green ice sheet bed is frozen and uh, nearly 33% is salt and uh, there's still 28% uh, remains quite unclear uh, if, if it is sold or if it is uh, frozen. So uh, w one of the reasons we want to uh, understand uh, to study the basal thermal conditions of the ice sheet is that the uh, the the uh, the thermal conditions can impact the uh, ice flow a lot. Uh, like the dual uh, liberty uh, relationship, uh, if the ice uh, goes from the cold from uh, and it turns to temperate, and say the water, water content increase from zero to one percent, the flow uh, the flow low rate will be like uh, three times bigger, and this <coughs> important um, mechanism is still not considered in most ice sheet models. And if we look into the ice sheet model simulation procedures, uh, we can also find that the geothermal heat flux uh, is very important for uh, the final results. So currently, the ice sheet model uh, have, in general, two different of uh, model initialization methods, uh, we, uh, which is the data simulation and the spin up, and uh, both of the uh, Initialize methods uh, need to invert the basal friction first, and uh, and then uh, fix the better uh, fix the basal, uh, basal fr friction uh, before they can uh, go to the uh, the future uh, transient simulations. And uh, uh, if we want to get a uh, uh, a um, 
uh, base of friction uh, for the ice sheet, we need to use a, um, uh, a ice temperature uh, field, uh, which is determined by the uh, geosome heat flux data. So, uh, and also for the uh, McGregor uh, study, they use 10 different uh, ESMIP6 models. And uh, this also uh, may raise a question that uh, some of the model uncertainty uh, can arise from the ice models themselves. And this is uh, one of our uh, study design that uh, we want to use a single ice model, uh, which is CISM here. So we do not consider uh, the uh, model uncertainty uh, from the ice models. And for our study, we spin up uh, for 10,000 years and uh, we uh, test two uh, cases. Uh, case one, we uh, co we constrain the base friction, which means we uh, nudge the uh, base friction during the spin up. Uh, it is what SISM did for the ISMIP ism 6 uh, experiments. And for the case two, we do not constrain the base, base friction. Uh, we do not nudge the, uh, the base friction during the spin up. Uh, we just apply a local uh, tumor. Uh, for the uh, basal uh, sliding uh, boundary condition. So uh, this, this table uh, displays seven uh, geothermal heat flow data we are using in this study. And uh, uh, these three guys use a, a similar machine learning uh, kind of uh, uh, techniques. And these three guys use a uh, mental model uh, method and the grid uh, data uh, use a ice flow model to invert the uh, just heat flow data. And from the, uh, this figure, we can see that for the seven uh, just heat, heat flow data, they look pretty uh, different from each other. And uh, if we run the uh, model for 10,000 years, and then we can get the basal temperature uh, distribution uh, across the uh, green heat and uh, clearly uh, it has some pretty uh, straightforward uh, correlation uh, with the uh, geosome heat flow data uh, like this guy it has the largest for the ice area and uh, which means uh, and also it has the uh, lowest mean uh, heat, fl heat flux data now we can see this pattern uh, more clearly uh, if, if we look at the uh, temperature anomaly uh, like this guy has the, the uh, coldest uh, basal temperature anomaly, and this guy has the, the uh, warmest uh, temperature uh, anomaly. We also want to uh, look at the dry wet uh, diagram and want to compare the season result with the uh, McGregor result. And you can see some, uh, the, the pattern is pretty close uh, to the uh, McGregor result, but they, there are still some large difference in the northern part of the Greenland ice sheet. And uh, if, if we look at the, uh, the, the ensemble spread, uh, we can find that uh, the large difference normally come from the cold ice uh, region uh, in place. So we also compare our uh, model, the results, uh, the basal, basal uh, temperature uh, with 27 ice borehole uh, observations and find some of them uh, have pretty good uh, agreement with the uh, in-situ data. So we also compare the uh, this surface velocity and the base of uh, friction uh, distribution. Uh, and uh, in, for, for case one, we, uh, for, for the velocity and the base of friction, we can see some uh, quite straightforward uh, uh, pattern that if we have lower base of friction, uh, the velocity is also higher. And also if we have a larger uh, base of friction, the velocity is lower uh, accordingly. But if we look at the velocity and the base of temperature, uh, things just go a, a bit complicated. Like uh, if we, ha we have a lower base of temperature, uh, the velocity is, is higher here. And if we have higher uh, base of temperature, like here, uh, you know, we have we have uh, we have uh, uh, lower uh, velocity here. 
So, um, so after have some discussion with Bill, we think it's kind of a, a result of the uh, base friction and nudging. Say, uh, in case if we have some lower temperature and the uh, the nudging uh, procedure will try to uh, match the um, observed ice geometry and uh, it will lower, try to lower the friction and uh, then get the higher velocity. Um, this uh, explanation can be partly uh, confirmed by case two, uh, which we do not con constrain the, uh, the base friction. So in case two, uh, we also compare the velocity and the, the basal temperature, and uh, we, we can see uh, this time a, a straightforward uh, connections uh, in between. Say uh, if we have lower basal temperature and then we have the lower velocity, and if we have the, the higher temperature and we have the higher velocity, uh, accordingly, so since uh, changed in the, in this case, then we um, tried to uh, compare the, uh, the the difference between the case two and the case one, and this is the basal temperature difference. Uh, we see a large difference occur as the as the cold uh, base regions. Also, uh, for the uh, surface velocity. We also uh, compare uh, the, the, the difference in between, and we see a large difference occur at the margin of the green ice sheet and also at, at the um, ice streams. And the velocity difference uh, can cause the difference in ice thickness. So clearly, if we have uh, uh, increased uh, ice velocity, uh, the ice thickness here would decrease. And if we have uh, decreased ice velocity, uh, the ice thickness will increase here. <clears throat> Finally, uh, we also try to uh, connect, uh, one, one want to connect, find some connection between the basal mill rate and the basal uh, temperature. Uh, there's some rough connections in between. Uh, so like here, uh, we have lower uh, basal mill rate and the lower uh, temperature, but uh, in general, we, we do not find find a very clear uh, pattern in space between the uh, these two uh, these two guys. Uh, and uh, we also try to calculate the uh, basal mill rates uh, 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 using the season results and compare the results with uh, with a previous study. So. Uh, in general, uh, generally speaking, if, if if we look at the uh, the pattern in space, these two uh, look similar. But if we compare the uh, magnitude of the basal mill rate, uh, they are still quite different. So uh, in this, this study, uh, it is like uh, two times bigger than the our uh, season results, but. Um, but we are still uh, still working on it. Uh, we're trying to why the, dis uh, the, the difference uh, is from, uh, and um, maybe it's because we use a different uh, calculation methods. So, and 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 here is is the final uh, conclusions. And uh, uh, first, uh, clearly, the uh, the basal heat flow data has some in quite important impact on the ice flows, and also. Uh, it is also important to to uh, uh, to choose a um, a, a base of slide law, and also we I think we should uh, focus more on at uh, at the uh, ice streams because ice streams can uh, trap ice mass across the whole um, ice flow basins, and also uh, for the basal mill rate uh, we do not uh, find some very clear patterns right now, but. Uh, uh, not sure. Uh, we are still working on it, and uh, we are we are still working on on, on a manuscript um, at this point. All right. So this is uh, all of my uh, talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, <clears throat> is there there's time for questions? Uh, Michael, go ahead. Sorry, that was a misclick. 
Oh, okay, then I could go ahead. Hey, thanks for the nice presentation. That, this is really interesting to me um, because I'm doing a lot of these Greenland spin ups myself. I was wondering, I think you spun up for 10 kilo years. Um, and in my experience, um, the ice sheet just continues warming up over this time scale because basically when you use present day boundary condition, uh, you don't get this cold signature that you would need from the last glacial maximum uh, to, to migrate down in the ice to get to a colder uh, base than what you get in a steady state relaxation to a present day boundary condition. So I'm wondering um, if you set it to 10 kilo years uh, is your ice sheet already in a steady state and if not you know why would you choose 10 um like what is what is the reasoning i think uh, in my experience like already after 5000 years it gets too warm uh yeah i think it's a good question uh we compare the results uh using 20,000 and, and 10,000 years. And uh, we find pretty similar results. And uh, if we look at the ice flux or the ice volume uh, change pattern, so uh, we can see the Greenland ice sheet, uh, at least in our cases, it, it is you know, uh, almost at the uh, transient e equilibrium state. So that's the main reason we want to use, I just want to stick with the 10,000 uh, years for our spin up experiments. All right, is there any other questions, Baton? Thank you, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Tong. Uh, great talk. Um, I was just wondering about Negus because. For those of us that model paleo Greenland, we're really struggling to get Northeast Greenland to grow out uh, to the mid-shelf. And one of the hypotheses for that is that we're not getting the velocity to match Nijis. Um, and, and that may be caused by some very specific geothermal heat flux conditions up there in the Northeast of Greenland. So I was wondering whether you have some of your results that show good matches with that like region of Greenland, or is this problematic for some of your results as well? Uh, thank you for your question. I um, so so I think we uh, we don't look at the uh, Nietzsche uh, region uh, specifically, but uh, we think in the northeastern part of Greenland that we we uh, we did. Uh, see some you know some some uh, differences um but uh, uh to be honest we uh we don't look at the uh, this part uh very carefully at this point because we are still on uh at a stage of uh, analyzing our results so uh if we find something interesting i, I think we can keep in touch and uh, you know, uh, share some some information but at, at this point we we don't find uh, very useful information for the, this uh, uh, this uh, specific uh, part of the green ice sheet. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, let's continue. And well, thank you, good transition because you're next. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I'll share uh, so, Tony, if you could, you could stop sharing your screen and. Um, Thank you, Ledger. It's going to um, give the last presentation of this first part of the, of the first part of this morning, uh, talking about the IGM to pre-industrial transient simulations of the green and ice sheet using the parallel ice sheet model forced with ICSM 1.2 and 1.3 climate data. And uh, take three when you're ready. The floor is yours. Cool. Thanks. Um, can you hear me and see my screen? Okay. So um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, research I'm conducting as part of a postdoc at the University of Sheffield. Uh, this is part of the PARGLAC uh, European Research Council grant that is looking at mapping subglacial and proglacial landforms around former ice sheets around the world. 
and um, kind of taking care of the green aspect of that grant uh, for the next two years. So um, why uh, reconstructing the green and ice past evolution? So there's, first of all, a lot of questions about the past evolution of Greenland that we don't know uh, answers to. So for example, we don't know for sure what the max extent and volume of the ice sheet was during the LGM, and therefore what its accurate sea level rise contribution was. As a result, we also don't really know what the past configuration of ice divides was at that time, um, including also the surface velocity and locations of major ice streams, which is quite important to understanding Greenland ice sheets. Uh, we don't really know how it responded to these big cooling and warming events that happened in the late glacial period. So, Henry Stadial 1 cooling, the Bowling Aller Road warming, Younger Dryas cooling, and then early Holocene warming, which all happened very shortly and very intensely. And so, uh, there is good arguments to think that this could still be having an impact on, on the behavior of Greenland today. And so, it's quite important to get that right. Um, and also, a big question that the community is asking itself is there is empirical evidence of more retreated than present. Uh, an ice sheet in certain areas during the Holocene thermal maximum, so between 6,000 years before present and, and three to 2,000 years before present. And one of the questions is how much more retreated? We actually have very little data to know that at the moment, so modeling could help. And then, as previously mentioned in this conference, there's also uncertainties about the future, so um, we need more accurate projections of future ice sheet mass loss to know and better plan for global sea level rise. For example, the last ISMIP 6 uh, for emission scenario 8.5 by the end of the century is estimating 90 millimeters plus or minus 50. So it's quite a large uncertainty uh, contribution from Greenland. So a lot of progress to make on that. And another key piece of information is that uh, climate changes on shorter timescales than continental ice sheet response. So it is now quite well recognized that the green ice sheet is not in equilibrium with climate. It is affected by a product of past changes potentially still reacting to the last deglaciation, but also to its extensive, its higher extent during cooling that happened during the late Holocene and into the Little Ice Age. So understanding past ice sheet dynamics may be important to account for when running our future green ice sheet projections, so doing a sort of hint casting methodology in our spin-up. So a big question is, would future green ice sheet projections differ if we run simulations with a Holocene calibrated transient simulation as spin-up? So to answer that question, we have a name of using the glacial geomorphological record in Greenland to calibrate an ice sheet model simulating the evolution of the ice sheet between the LGM to the pre-industrial. So this research has two components. On the left-hand side of that diagram, you have the empirical reconstruction, which is something I've started, uh, well, part like I started that a few years ago, and I've continued working on that. So it combines ice marginal landform mapping around the whole of Greenland and also compiling all the geochronology studies which looked at radiocarbon and cosmogenic dates of ice sheet margin retreats, and basically constructing this empirical isochron reconstruction through time from 14 to 6.5k, which is when we have data on land. And then on the right-hand side of the screen is the modeling component of the experiment, which is to run this large ensemble of Pinsent simulations that we forth with static data, but also atmospheric and ocean forcing data. And then bringing those two pieces of information together by scoring this ensemble simulations with the empirical isochron reconstruction, and hopefully eventually get a Holocene calibrated prism simulation of green sheet evolution from the LGM to present. So these red boxes highlight where we are now in the project. So it's very much work in progress. Uh, we're pretty much ready to submit or start writing the paper. Sorry, we've pretty much got all the data for the empirical side of the project. And then from the modeling side of the project, I'm currently running my first ensemble simulations. So there'll still be a long time before we are actually ready to score these simulations against the empirical record. But today I'd like to talk about more specifically the atmospheric and the ocean forcing data that um, involves IACESM data from NCAR, which is why I think it's relevant to this conference and this group. So PISM is a three-dimensional ice sheet model using hybridized dynamics. So uh, shallow ice approximation plus shallow shelf approximation for the sub environment and the grounding line conditions. Um, PISM efficiently transforms atmospheric forcing data into the surface mass burns, in our case using a positive degree day model, which accounts for snow accumulation, melt of snow, melt of ice, fern compaction, refreezing, etc. Um, our goal again is to run an ensemble of simulations from 24K to pre-industrial at 5 kilometer resolution for the whole of Greenland 
with a monthly computation of ice flux, because this is how PISM works. Um, and the surface mass balance is computed hourly by the positive degree day model. So ideally, what we want in terms of climate forcing and, and ocean forcing um, is a seasonally resolved spatially and temporally variable two meter air temperature and precipitation fields and as continuous as possible between 24k and present or pre-industrial. Uh, the people that, you know, the classic studies that have modeled the past um, green and ice sheet evolution from LGM to present have used most of the time a glacial index method, which is uh, model data from GCMs at pre-industrial and at the LGM, and then you vary between those using ice core or temperature variations. The problems with this approach is that it is spatially invariant data. There is no seasonality, so we can't feed our PD model with good summer, I mean, a uh, mean summer temperature, which is very important for Greenland. And also precipitation, precipitation is often just scaled from temperature using an equation, and it's not independent data. So we wanted to come up with something a bit more sophisticated by uh, collaborating with people at NCAR. Uh, in our case, it's Yang working at UCAR, Yang Su, um, and actually use data from ICES and 1.2 and 1.3. So for air, for air temperature, first of all, on the right side of the screen, you see a diagram which is just time series data from one specific point in space. It's the center of the green ice sheet. I'll show you temperature fields around across the whole domain um, in a minute, but uh, this is better to explain you how we come up with this curve and this data. Um, at the bottom, the black curve is mean annual temperature through time, so we're going back from 24K to present. And at the top is mean summer temperature, so June, July, August. Um, uh, so we take the temperature at reference height. This data is continuous and it's from the iTrace experiment, so it's ICSM output data from 20k to 11k. Uh, that gives us trends in data, which is great. Then we have time slice simulations by ICESM 1.3 for 21k, so LGM and pre-industrial that you can see by these dots on the right hand side. Uh, then we have ICESM 1.2 data for the other time slice simulations, 9k, 6k, and 3k. So this is data that we got thanks to Yangsu at UCAR. And the question is, how do we connect those dots to try to get continuous data? Um, we could do a linear interpolation, so basically draw some straight lines between those points. Or we could use other data that was made available by Buzet et al. 2018. So these two curves that I just added are the data by Buzet et al. Uh, published in Nature in 2018. Oh, I think it was Geophysical Research Letter, sorry. Um, so this data is a combination of the previous ICSM trends and simulation, trace 21K merged with three green and ice cores. And what we can do is use the wiggles, uh, so the magnitude variations from this data set, and apply it to our data, so that we basically get this final curve. Uh, so you'll note that between 24K and 21, we just do a very simple linear um, progression of the data towards the 21K state. Uh, so we basically get it in equilibrium by 21K. But uh, if until uh, between, sorry, 21 and present, we connect our missing gaps of data by using the magnitude variation from Buzet et al. So we, in, we input this data to PISM at 50 year temporal resolution. And then on top of that, uh, PISM reads this data uh, and creates a cosine yearly cycle uh, to feed monthly temperature to the positive degree day model. Okay, so these are the temperature fields. So it's the same data that's across the domain. Uh, hopefully, you can see Greenland in there. Um, so you have a, four different insets. We have the temperature in degrees Celsius. You can see the scale on the right for the LGM 21K, the peak cooling during the Heinrich Schedule 1. That's right there during this really strong cooling in Greenland. Uh, we have the peak warming during the Holocene thermal maximum, so 6K around here. Um, and this is mean annual temperature, sorry. And then the pre-industrial on the far right. And you can see the same for summer at temperature here. Uh, so we have those states. Interestingly, during the Holocene thermal maximum, we have really strong warming in the Southwest, which potentially explains why we have more retreats in this area um, when we look at the empirical record. So that's quite interesting. So this is where we fit into PISM for the air temperature. Uh, this is just a diagram showing you the difference between the pre-industrial and the LGM. 
the mean annual temperature. Um, so you can see some really strong differences over, over the lower end tides, so North America and then the Eurasian ice sheet, because we, we lose the ice sheets, so we lose the elevation. Uh, so there's pretty strong warming over there. The warming over Greenland is in the order of 10 to 20 cent, uh, degrees. This is the same for summer temperature. So a warming over Greenland of between uh, you know, 5 to 18 degrees. We have this really strong uh, signal of warming during the summers in West Greenland, which is quite interesting. And, and, and again, a reason why this sort of data could be of interest rather than using a glacial index from ice cores, because we do see these atmospheric patterns um, forming over different regions of Greenland, which could be forcing our, our model and having an impact on our model simulations. Uh, this is just to show you that we did the same with precipitation fields. So we take uh, convective and large scale precipitation, add them together. We have the data from iTrace, the data from uh, all these tight slide simulations from ICSM 1.3 and 1.2, uh, and we make this curve. So this is one point uh, on the right for the center of the green ice sheet. So you can see that at the center of the green ice sheet during the Holocene, we had seven times more precipitation than during the LGM approximately. Uh, again, 50 year temporal resolution input data uh, into PISM. This is the precipitation field showing you the same information as before, I guess. Um, so you can see the rates of precipitation through time. And you can see that there is a lot of precipitation during the Holocene and pre-industrial in the Southeast and in the South, which is brought by the North, Amer North Atlantic uh, water that is transferred into uh, Southeast Greenland by the Irmingen, Irmingen current um, and effectively brought back to the West by the West Greenland current and evaporation. This is the difference in precipitation between the uh, pre-industrial and LGM, uh, you can see this big difference in the south. So that's quite interesting. Um, and then for the sea surface temperature forcing, we use the Osman et al. 2021 data, which is global sea surface temperature field from 24K to present at 200 year temporal resolution. And it's a merge product of ICESM um, and sea surface temperature proxy data from about 500 ocean core records using data simulation. So here is a figure from Osman awesome Natal 2021 where you can see all the different proxy record locations that they use in their data simulation of the ICSM data. Um, and you can see there's a lot of blue dots around Green and South Greenland. So a lot of these records are from uh, Delta 18 um, marine ocean core records, basically, to try to get sea surface temperature signals. Uh, this shows you time series of sea surface temperature around different locations of Greenland from 24K to present. So we have uh, Cape Farewell, the very south of the tip of Greenland. And then Denmark, Denmark Strait is between Iceland and Greenland. Uh, Nordic Sea is northeast Greenland, Baffin Bay, west Greenland, and then the Arctic Ocean to the very north, where we have very little variation in sea surface temperature throughout the record. We also feed uh, PISM with salinity data, for which I use the exact same protocol as the precipitation. Um, and temperature uh, that I've just shown you, so data from ICSM. These are sea surface temperature fields that we feed into PISM through time. Again, you can see the, uh, the effect of warm waters coming from the southeast because of the North Atlantic current uh, turning into the Umegu current, and then that warming um, coming through the domain during the Holocene thermal maximum and the late Holocene uh, period. Uh, yeah, note that we actually interpolate beneath all landmass that data so that when we have retreating ice shelves throughout simulation, they constantly have some sea surface temperature data underneath them to get the basal melt underneath the ice shelf. <clears throat> so for the spin-up or simulation, we basically use the 24K state of our forcing data and we run peasant for 30,000 years until we get steady state. So steady state of the volume, but also steady state of the sub glacial velocity, which takes quite a long time in PISM to actually stabilize. Um, you can see on the, on the right here, the start and the end states of um, surface velocity and then thickness at the bottom. And this is uh, our spin up steady state uh, of the surface mass balance, so accumulation divided by ablation. So you can see really high surface mass balance in red and very much lower uh, surface mass balance or accumulation, sorry, in blue, because all of this is positive surface mass balance of the LGM. So 
This is also to tell you that we're not just considering this modeled input climate forcing data as a given. We acknowledge that there is large uncertainties in this data. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So it is quite important to actually vary some of this input uh, climate data in our ensemble. So these are all the 15 parameters that we selected to vary during our ensemble, which I've just started a few weeks ago. And there is five of them that relate to varying atmospheric forcing and surface mass balance. So those three ones in the top box relate to how we vary surface mass balance. So we vary the melt factor of ice, we vary the melt factor of snow, but we also vary uh, how much the standard deviation of daily temperature variability in our surface mass balance um, calculation. So um, that is in relation to elevation and so distance to the ocean. There is much more or less daily variability that the model constrains on so that that controls the amount of positive degree days we get at a specific location. But we also, um, within our ensemble simulations, vary the input temperature fields by this range, minus 3.5 to 3.5 degrees. Uh, this was given by, uh, this is informed by data from Osman et al, who run this um, analysis of standard deviations from all these different ensemble simulations they did. Um, so this is the sort of data we get over Greenland when we look at their data. And then we also vary precipitation input fields from 75% to 125%. So any sort of ensemble simulations will have a value within those ranges. So at the moment, this is a two minute warning. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so at the moment, we're running the first ensemble of 45 simulations, which from the L from 24K to 17, then we'll do a parameter sensitivity analysis, and then we'll run a larger ensemble after that, once we've actually highlighted which parameter matter the most. This is to show you the impact of different climate input that we do by varying these um, ensemble parameters of surface mass balance and input climate. So here you have the cumulative surface accumulation rate for all different simulations. So each line is a simulation that has run from uh, 24 kbp to 17 kbp. And you can see that it's up to five times higher surface accumulation depending on um, the parameters that we use mostly for precipitation and temperature. So um, we are playing with climate quite a bit here. Uh, these different simulations uh, you know, produce some different sea level contribution time series that you can see here. So we're talking at the LGM or at the, at the peak extent, which is at 17K, we're talking between, at the moment, between three and eight meters of sea level rise contribution from Greenland. So it, there's a lot of variations in our ensemble simulations because we're varying with parameters quite conservatively. So, and these are the grounding lines, uh, variations for each simulation. So each line is a simulation of that ensemble. Um, which is not finished at all. We've only done like 15 out of the 45, and, and we're going to do many more after that. So this is very preliminary results. As I was saying in my question to Tom earlier, we're struggling to get anything out to the mid-shelf or outer continental shelf in the northeast of Greenland, which is a problem that a lot of us have when we simulate paleo evolution. But other, other areas have ice sheets, rounded ice reaching to the continental shelf edge in a lot of parts of Greenland, so we're pretty happy with that. Um, uh, don't have time to show these videos, but I have videos of trends and simulations. Um, yeah, okay, that's me done. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. So we have time for a couple of questions. There's already one in the chat. Um, Heiko is asking, what does PISM do with sea surface temperature? Uh, so we have an ocean model, which basically computes basal melt rates and temperature from thermodynamics in the battery layer. Um, it's a pretty simple model that was published in 1999 by Holland and Jenkins, I think. Um, and yeah, it, it basically has an, as input it has um, <clears throat> sea surface temperature and salinity, um, and it basically computes the melt rate from that. I'm not too sure if I can give you more detail than that because I'm I'm a glacial geologist. <laughs> I started modeling like six months ago. So I'm still learning a lot of, of this at the moment. <laughs> well, that's perfect. Thanks. If nobody else has a question, I could ask one more. Um, so 
um, I was wondering, so you present kind of a large range of different simulations, um, but you also have, and this is maybe your main uh, um, interest or, or focus, you have all these constraints. So can you can you lay out a bit how you're going to use this constraint to to narrow down the ensemble? Yeah, so if you can see my screen still, I have this slide. Um, so this, this sort of explains what we're going to do with the model data comparison analysis. So we, we have these shape file lines like drawn here in red, orange, and green, which are different constant confidence levels in our isochrones. So let's say that this is the, the former extent of the ice sheet that we think reached at uh, between 10 and 9.5 thousand years before present. And the blue line is the PISM model extent from that same period. What we're going to do is we have these tools that Palglac has been putting up together. So Jeremy Ely and Rosie Archer have been putting up these algorithms that will measure the distance between the modeled cells and the cells that cross this shapefile line. And we'll have different ways of weighting the distances uh, dependent given the confidence that we have in this isochrome line. So we'll have Bayesian statistics that will allow us to know and to basically um, score differently the simulation based on its distance to the isochrone, whether we're dealing with a high confidence isochrone or a low confidence isochrone. So yeah, we're going to release this product of different isochrones and different confidence levels, and then we're going to use that for model scoring. So it's basically all ice extent at the moment. We might be using dipstick models from cosmogenic nuclei to look at ice thickness. Uh, but yeah, it's mostly we're mostly thinking of scoring our model simulations based on ice extent because there is so much data for the early Holocene in Greenland um, that constrains that retreat pretty well. So that's I, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's really cool. Yeah, thanks. All right. <laughs> Any more questions for Thank you. Yeah, I don't see any. So I uh, will suggest that we uh, take a little break. Uh, it is 10.36. Let's reconvene at 10.55 to get like a 20 minute breather. And, um, and then team will launch the second half of this morning. So see you all in 20 minutes. Please feel free to talk to one another uh, if you want to. Uh, we're not closing this link. And uh, yeah, see you in 20 minutes. Thank you for all the morning presenters. And uh, if you haven't done so already, if you could send me or Elizabeth your slides, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Are you? Do you want to take a break? Otherwise, I can get back to you later. Oh no! I'm happy to chat if uh, you. Not, I have. I have. Uh, I had two more thoughts I wanted to raise. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, one thing I was wondering: so you're using the climate now for one specific climate model, mm -hmm. and when you look at climate reconstructions for different uh, time periods, uh, the patterns they can look quite different. Mm -hmm. So I see that you change uh, parameters and then how you let's say downscale the climate with your positive degree there model. Uh, but um, I was wondering if if you could think of a way that you sample the uncertainty in the original driving climate forcing itself, you know, some kind of modification of the pattern or, you know, somewhere that that you that you broaden a bit your climate patterns, not just the the amplitude, let's say, but but the pattern of the so you're suggesting looking at ensemble simulations from the GCM and kind of find a, a pattern of uncertainty depending on, on the time, basically, so temporal dependent variability. I'm, I'm not having a clear idea in my mind how to do it uh, technically, but but I, I mean, it's just to say that I think this is an important uncertainty that's kind of missing. I, I think you're uh, your approach is quite holistic in you know how you sample different uncertainties, uh, how you reconstruct the forcing. I really like it, but this would be the point where where I'd be critical to because you kind of tie your evolution really to the to the climatic pattern of that one 
climate model reconstruction. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is which is a bit of a problem because then it's it's a, it's a difficulty to score and track the scoring of simulations if we um, if we change the climate through the time of the simulation and if we have more complex. So that's why we went for this very simple sort of parameterization of just changing the input climate. Um, yeah. But yeah. Like, well, maybe it, in the first attempt, it wouldn't have to be changing over time. You could uh, maybe get a hold of some pattern variations that you could somehow impose on it. I'm, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm mm. very loosely speaking. Yeah, I, I don't have a concrete machine learning uh, idea, whatever, how, how to implement that. But um, that that seems to me like a big uncertainty. Yeah, no, I think this is a really good point. Yeah, thank you. And the other thing I was wondering, so you um, started your introduction with saying how your method is kind of improving on these more simpler index methods. Uh, did you consider kind of going back like from your fully reconstructed climate to kind of distill back to a, um, let's say a reconstructed index from the climate, full climate that you have now in order to compare, you know, what, what is the added benefit of having that full full complexity in the climate forces yeah i think we could we could definitely compare the two pretty easily actually that could be a um a good added analysis to do yeah i haven't looked you at it do yet. it just for like i don't know in the end for your best um run or something like this you wouldn't have mm -hmm. to do it for everything but i think that would be really interesting to see you know uh yeah what what is what is the benefit of of doing this complex uh, simulation mm. compared to simpler places. Yeah, because yeah, we, we kind of had a chat with Jeremy and Sarah Bradley about this and and really just sort of concluded that it would be just better, I guess, because trying to get trying to make it more realistic, but we haven't done any actual analysis on that. Um, check well, it looks much better, that's for sure. I mean, yeah. You have like a full climate rather than just one index for the entire ice sheet. So I, I think there's a good reason to believe that that's an improvement. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting to like to go back and and especially to not just use the index like we used to back in the days, but to reconstruct the index from your complex mm -hmm. uh, to kind of from the complex go down to the simplified. Yeah. I think that would be really interesting. I think what's definitely a benefit is that we do have these different patterns between mean annual and mean summer temperature. Um, and it seems that, you know, a lot of the melt and a lot of the retreat that has been experienced in Greenland for the Holocene was, you know, caused by summer, summer temperatures so, and summer melt. So getting that right is quite important. And I think it's quite a, a problem with the index method um, that you don't get that seasonality. But um, yeah, very good. Uh, thanks for the suggestion. That's great. Yeah, no problem. Great talk. Yeah. Um, I'll take a tea now. <laughs> later. Sounds good. All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I actually I I Thank 
for a second. So there's an ocean, perhaps. So You know what I mean, but try not to, man. <laughs> Valentine's Day was the uh... Yeah, you, you know, so I took to you because we to get these things, and you know, when we arrived, I'm like, "Can I have a muffin, Dad?" Yeah. <laughs> 
You were. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we won't bother us by much. They'll have to eat the rest. <laughs> they are pretty good. They are. So those are a staple in our house half the year. Like, I go to Costco about every two weeks. About every other trip, I buy two things of muffins. And my son and my husband eat them all. I don't usually go near them because they're dangerous for me. It's like 600 calories in one of those, and it's hard to stop. <laughs> I've had a little one this morning because I'm good. <laughs> one of them is 600 calories. <laughs> <laughs> but you're fine. Yeah, you can do those things. <laughs> I could if I would exercise any bit more. But, like, it took me like 10 miles you know, on the coat and bike to lose 300 calories. So, yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to bike back to 20 miles. Okay. <laughs> Great. I was going to join um, a, an actual gym, and I, I feel like this is the heat somehow, <laughs> but I think it needs to happen. There's a lot of it, 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 it's a good resolution of every year. Yeah. Okay, this is your exercise. I'm like, oh, you're getting old. <laughs> well, I went into her blood work once while I went to the family history of mm -hmm. And like, all of my numbers were high. Mm -hmm. And you know, I run, I bike, live in Boulder, not enough. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hello again, everybody. Uh, we are going to continue our morning session here. I hope you had time to stretch and uh, get your caffeine back up. And our next speaker um, is going to be um, Tim van der Acker, van der Acker, and he's going to present us um, committing to the cause, including seeing rates in Antarctic ice sheet simulation using CISM. So Tim, if you have your slides, uh, present to the team. I do have my slides. Awesome. Let me. And we can show you great. I cannot share my screen because Google Film has not screen recording permission on your computer, so I, you have to do it for me. I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> uh, do I have your slides? Uh, I sent them yesterday to Elizabeth. So not okay. Maybe then I should have your slide and uh, let me add it. Um, <clears throat> by the way, Tim, um, I just got an email a few minutes ago saying that you're giving an oral presentation to EGU on yeah. April 20th. Oh, yeah. oh nice. I, did did, did, you, did, I get did you know that? No. <laughs> Congratulations. So I, 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 I don't do. think I have the slides, uh, Tim. Can you send them to me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will do them. There you go. Yes. There we go. Yes. Uh, go ahead. Nice. Thank you. Thank you, Gute. And uh, sorry about the issues. I, I should have tested it in the in the in the break. I I didn't do it. 
Okay, so hi, hi everybody. My name is uh, Tim, Tim van den Akker. I'm a Dutch PhD student at the University of Utrecht, uh, where I am right now. Well, not at university, I mean, obviously, but, but in Utrecht. Um, <clears throat> and for this project, I uh, am trying to do future projections of uh, the Antarctic ice sheet using the uh, using SISM, uh, together with Bill and Gunther, and uh, with Willem-Jan van der Berg and Roderick, from, uh, Roderick van der Waal from uh, Utrecht University. Next slide, please. So, this figure is, or this, this, yeah, this figure is going to be the, the this, at the center of the talk. This is the uh, observed mass change rate of Antarctica, as published by Ben Smith in 2020, uh, I believe. So basically, the latest uh, DHDT, as we like to call it, the DHDT is the thickness change rate of Antarctica. Uh, you can find in literature right now. And um, the main thing that I wanted, well, I want you to know from this picture, is that it's, that it's non-zero, and that's obvious for us as, as glaciologists and ice modelers, I think. But uh, as you can see, there's large thinning in uh, rates in, in, in the Amundsen Sea region and uh, some areas where the ice is also thickening, uh, for example, at Camp or at uh, Emory uh, Ice Shelf as well, a little bit. But it's non-zero. Mm -hmm. So next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So uh, for our future predictions, what we usually do and what, what I do at the moment as well is we, uh, we tune. We tune our uh, uh, basal sliding law parameters in our basal sliding law to match the grounded ice uh, thickness with observations. And for floating ice, we tune the ocean temperature on a cell basis to uh, match observed thickness of the floating ice uh, as close as possible with observations. Um, and there is a hidden assumption in there, basically saying we're done with that uh, tuning as soon as we are as close as we can get to the, to the, to the observed thickness of the ice sheet that is right now. Um, that means that if the ice sheet is still changing in thickness, so if there is a DHCT of non-zero, that means that we're either moving closer towards our uh, target, which is good, so we keep doing that, or we're moving away from our target, which means that our previous time step, we were closer to our target, so we should tune a little bit better so that we get back into closer uh, proximity of the observational target. So thereby, we're done as soon as our DHT doesn't, or as, as our thickness doesn't change anymore. So if our DHT is zero, so if our ice sheet is in complete equilibrium and as close to observation as possible, we're we're happy with our uh, spin up. However, if you're going to do future projections uh, and you're not just doing experiments with model drift, I mean, or uh, uh, parameter sensitivities, then uh, starting from that position is basically starting with a completely uh, equilibrialized ice sheet, Antarctic ice sheet. Which, as we just, sh just showed you in the figure, it's not the case. Like, uh, Antarctica is losing mass at most, at the most parts of the Amundsen Sea region. And it's, I mean, DHCT isn't zero. So, um, we try to work around this a little bit by adding the DHCT to our SMB. So, consider a cell, for example, in the Amundsen Sea region, where there is observed thinning of five meters per year. We add this five meters of year thinning to our surface mass balance uh, so that this particular cell with, with the experience is five meters per thinning now gets five meters more surface mass balance. We tune it in the same way, so towards equilibrium. And then as soon as we uh, do our projection run or our future run, we remove this again from the surface mass balance. So that instantly at the moment, the start of the spin up, of the, at the start of the future run, we get the exact numerically correct thinning rates from the observations of Ben Smith uh, uh, that I presented to you earlier. So um, we basically train the model to uh, using the same uh, tuning technique as we did before to get rid of more or less mass accordingly to the, the DHCT figures from observations. So what do we get to the end of the spin-up is a well-matching thickness, actually a very well-matching thickness because we tune on the cell by cell basis. As a bonus, we actually also get a well-matching surface velocities. We don't tune directly for the surface velocities, but if you get the thicknesses right and the grounding line in the right position, then your surface velocities are in good agreement with observations. And also, and that's the main new thing that, that we try now, is that you get the exact observed DHT values at t equals zero. So I use, usually used in previous talks an analogy of this little man that's been held by the hand. Like what, what, what you basically want to do is that SISM is this little man. And as soon as you're done with the spin-up, this, this hand drops the little man and it starts to run with exactly the correct DHCT values that you wanted to have. So uh, I just added it. Um, next slide, please. 
So if you do a spin-up, uh, your spin-up, the, the end result looks like this. Um, the main on the left, you can see like in the purplish figure, the thickness differences and the grounding line positions uh, for the whole of Antarctica. Down the right, you can see the velocity difference of Antarctica uh, uh, with, with observations. And on the top right, you can see the Amundsen Sea region specifically because that area proves to be important in the rest of the study. Um, and what you can basically see is that the that the thickness difference is really really small. It's doing quite a good job. Grounding line position is also almost everywhere at exactly the same location as you would want it to be. Service velocities are a little bit more off because we don't really tune it for it. But um, as you can see in the next slide, so next slide, please. The velocity bias is, and the root mean square error is 7 and 150 meters, which is still very good if you compare it, for example, to the ISMIP 6 uh, uh, studies done. The thickness bias is way smaller in the spin-up uh, because we actually tune for that. So we get into the range of 30 meters of thickness biases over the, uh, our root mean square error over the whole of Antarctica. And then the average grounding line positions difference with uh, respect to obs the observed grounding line with 1.5 kilometer on average on the whole of Antarctica on a four kilometer grid. So this basically means that if you uh, have eight uh, points with the grounding line in it, five of them are in exactly the right spot on the model. And three of them are just one cell next or uh, in one cell adjacent to, to the observed grounding line of it. So that's also something that is really, really nice to see. So we're kind of happy with that. So next slide, please. So actually, what this whole effort that we've been doing so far in the beginning was was to uh, to, to try stuff with the basal friction law. Like, what is the effect of including this news at Iverson regularized Coulomb friction law? Does it matter much? Uh, how sensitive are the results to that? Or what what kind of physics do we introduce by that? So, as a first experiment, what we actually did is we we tried the spin up, we pushed it into the future with three different basal sliding laws. Uh, so on the top you can see the regularized Coulomb law, which is with Iverson. The left down left you can see Schuf, and to the right you see power law. It doesn't really matter what specific the, those those laws have, but these are these are three distinctive basal friction laws, and uh, they, you, they, there are some differences in the runs. This is after a thousand years after the spin-up has been uh, completed and pushed into the future. Um, so there is possibly a couple of grounding lines that have shifted a little bit, but there is, I mean, the main thing with these runs is that the Western Antarctic ice sheet collapses with using all three basal friction laws. So and when we actually found this, we felt like, oh, this is this is this is funny. Like, I mean, if you do this 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 the spin up in the way that we do it now with the DACT added to it, you're basically doing runs in which you can say, okay, what if we at this moment, particular moment, stop completely with emitting CO2 and climate change at all, and we just keep the thinning rates as as if they were now, and they don't decrease anymore. There's no climate change. There's nothing else. What happens if you then push Antarctica into the future? This happens. Or in other words, SISM thinks or, or SISM says that the West Antarctic ice sheet is already going to collapse without further climate change. And that is something that, that, that is quite significant and also a bit grim and scary, if you ask me personally. So we, we wanted to uh, yeah, see what is, what is the robustness actually of these results. Like what is SISM actually telling us about the West Antarctic ice sheet and the collapse of it? So next slide, please. I, oh, oh, sorry. This this is another uh, uh, figure that you can that you can use to quantify this. So a lot of the figures in the next slides will be look will look like this. This is on the 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 left the y-axis is ice volume lost, and on the right axis is sea level rise in red. <clears throat> and um, this is for the whole of Antarctic ice sheet. And the black line is always what would happen if you just take the current observed mass change rates and you just time integrate them uh, until the end of your uh, simulation. Now the other lines are with different experiments, in this case with the basal friction law. So what you can actually see is here that, that for the whole of Antarctica, you kind of get away with using the DACT values of present day for the first 400 years. But after 400 years of, into your spin-up or into your future prediction, you're, uh, you see quite a, a sharp increase in uh, ice volume loss and sea level rise caused by the Western Antarct Arctic ice collapse. Okay, next slide, please. And you can also make the same figures for the Amundsen Sea uh, region, specifically for Twaits on the left and Pine Island on the right. And they show the same behavior. Uh, actually, Twaits is collapsing a little bit earlier than Pine Island in these cases. But uh, spe specifically talking about basal friction, we see that it doesn't matter much with basal friction law you choose. They all collapse. They collapse with a little bit different timing. Um, and But they arrive after Faust years roughly at the same situation. Next slide, please. 
so then I thought, like, what is what are assumptions in the model right now that could change this uh, collapse? So I tried the GAA. Previously, I didn't run with the GAA model. Now I run with uh, a relaxed asthenosphere with uh, a, a time a relaxation time in the order of 100 years, and with an FR fast response. Actually, that should be instant response uh, asthenosphere as well. And as you can see, if you just use the relaxed asthenosphere, which is a quite crude approximation, but still, it, it, it's better than nothing. Um, you can see that the effect is very small. However, if you do instant rebound, you can see that the collapse actually stops. However, if you do an instant rebound in this case, you get uplift rates of around 10, 20 to 50 centimeters per year, which are quite large, really large, like not found in the literature amount large. So that's, I believe it's not really uh, physically defendable to use this. Next slide, please. Now, what about gamma zero? Is it a parameter in our basal friction or in a basal melt parameterization? Yes, the increasing your gamma zero and thereby increasing your basal melting uh, makes the collapse happen faster. Decreasing it makes the collapse happen slower. And in a thousand years, you can see that for the, the dotted lines, these are the uh, ones with the very low gamma value, the collapse doesn't happen yet. So, next slide, please. I thought, like, uh, is this something, is the collapse not happening yet, or is it just a timing issue? If we extend the simulation for another thousand years, what happens then? Uh, you can actually see that it still happens. It still happens at the same rate, actually, like the uh, the lines are as steep as before. Just It just takes longer for the collapse to uh, start. But still, after 2,000 years, you end up for Twaits and Pine Island at the same position and with the same rate as soon as the collapse uh, was initiated. Next slide, please. Can it be stopped then? If we, uh, if we, if the, if the collapse is well underway, what do we do? Um, so what I did here is I did the normal 500 years continuation uh, run, and after 500 years, I uh, decreased the ocean temperature with either five or uh, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, or 2 Kelvin. And uh, for pine island and waves here, you can see that after uh, 500 years, you need a two degrees cooling to stop this. Uh, uh, collapse from happening. All the other instant coolings, like from, from 0 0.5 to 1.5, don't do much. As soon as the retreat is on, well underway, you need quite a strong cooling for it to, to be stopped. Next slide, please. Then this is an, an, a sensible a sensitivity experiment where uh, I tried to okay, so a very extreme case in which I say to the left, I, sub I increase the ocean temperature at 5 degrees, and to the right, I decrease the ocean temperature at 5 degrees. So on the left, you, you basically get some kind of ABOMIP experiment where after 100 years, you lose all your shelves and your grounding lines are so far inland and the velocities are so high that, that, that it actually collapses into CFL errors. And into the right, you can uh, you get a quite logical advanced grounding line thickened Antarctic ice sheet because of no basal melt at all. Next slide, please. So the conclusion so far now is that uh, given the current DHCT rates that are observed, Twaits and Pine Island Glacier will collapse according to the to SISM, and also for using different, uh, many different parameterization. It seems almost not sensitive to the basal friction, the GAA, the increased gamma zero, uh, and ocean collision interpolation and spin-ups. And the last two I, I didn't talk about yet, but I can tell you later if you like. It seems to be sensitive to low gamma zero values. It slows down the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet, but it doesn't stop it. Uh, or you need unrealistic uh, direct uplifting rates uh, of more than 10 centimeters per year uh, in those regions uh, for it to, and, and with an instant rebound as well for it to stop the uh, collapse ha from happening. And once it is initiated, you need an ocean temperature decrease of like two kilometers to stabilize, but not really regrow the West Antarctic ice sheet. So to stop the collapse in its, uh, in its run. Next slide, please. That was it. Uh, I should also mention that we are still, we're trying out if this is something with, with system itself or this is something uh, uh, model related. So we're, we at the uh, Utrecht University have also two ice models at our disposal. Uh, we're trying the same method um, uh, as we used here to see if this is something uh, really significant or just something that is interesting with what happens in system if you do uh, an approach like this. But that was it. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you so much, Tim. We have time for some questions. And Heiko, why don't you go ahead? 
Can you mute yourself? Doesn't have to be always me that asks this question, but I, I just type <laughs> chat uh, before I forget it. Uh, so if somebody else wants to go first, please go ahead. Oh, you have the floor, so just go ahead. Okay. So I was wondering if you impose the DHT by putting it in the SMB, aren't you assuming that the DHT is caused by the SMB? Or in other words, if you then relax to that original SMB, um, then the change that you see is because of that difference in SMB, whereas the original DHTT could also come from ice dynamics, it could come from long-term adjustment or something else that is not well represented in SMB. That is true. Um, however, I, I don't, I mean, this is a philosophical question, of course, like where does the DHTT come from? Um, if you do it like this, then what at least what, what I could try with with SISM is that you don't get the ACT caused by the SMB. I mean, you, of course, it's caused by the SMB, but the main thing is that if you tune uh, your friction using a DHT and you compare it to one where you don't tune uh, for the friction with the, without the DHT and you give the field that you get from the DHT run to the model that didn't use the DHT, you get the same DHT pattern. So in a sense now, we we, we assume that our uh, DHT on ground ice comes from basal friction, so sliding, and our DHT in, in the ocean comes from basal melting. Does that make sense? Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, I haven't thought long enough to uh, to answer back to that. But I mean, my I, let's say my suspicion is this. Um, if it could be that the DHT in the real world is caused by a different process than by the one that you're inducing. And yeah. I, I can't put more arguments to it, but I, I think it would be interesting to think a bit more about that. If you know, and maybe think of an experiment and in an idea setting or whatever where you can check if that's really what's happening. That's just yeah. an idea. I mean I, I guess that this this is this is something that's that's not it. There is there is no ice dynamics or ice dynamics DHT in in this process. Like you, we we tune both things for on the cell by cell basis. So if you for example lose butt dressing and you get like a DHT that is caused by some some ice shelf that has collapsed or something in 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 the in in, in uh, let's say the recent past, that's not that's not what you get of course from from this approach. So that is indeed a good good point that you're making. Yeah. And and uh, I should have said that in the beginning, but I like the idea. It, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm interested in it. <laughs> Thanks. We had a question. Uh, or more of a comment. I was going to add that <clears throat> this was originally motivated because we had to cool temperatures so much in the Amundsen Sea region to get an uh, ice sheet in steady state. So what we find is that if you artificially enhance the mass balance by, say, five meters per year, then that means that the ocean temperatures will adjust to compensate that with melting of five meters per year. And the interesting thing there is that, um, in fact, when you do that, you don't do much adjustment at all in the sense that the observed temperatures are sufficient to produce melting of five meters per year. Uh, <clears throat> so so I, I think at this point, I'm comfortable with adding a term to the mass balance. You can, it, you don't have to call it SMB, it's just a, ter a term. Um, but where I'm, where I'm still a bit confused is about adding this term to grounded ice as well. Maybe maybe it's something we could follow up about and try to convince ourselves that makes sense or not. Yeah, no, I agree. Keshwan has a question. So I, I talked yeah. to so. mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Tim. Very good uh, talk. I, I, uh, I specifically interested in the GIA corrections in your talk, and I wonder, which component in in the GIA correction you 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 coupled with the ice sheet model? So uh, you coupled with the bad rock topography evolution, also the local state level change around the ice sheet. Both of them are just the one of them. Um, do you mean like what? So if the ice disappears, do I then only take care of the of the of the cell that this where the ice has recently disappeared, and or not the cells around it? Is that is that what you're asking? Uh, I'm asking so the so the GIA response they include the solid earth. Uh, I mean the bedrock topography 
uh, evolution, right? This part. Mm -hmm. Also, the the regional <laughs> scale level uh, also will will change. So, so did you also include that part? No. Nope. So only the bedrock to forward yeah. evolution. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. One last question. Should yeah. Sorry. Ahead. We can we can follow up on this later, but so I was curious if the um, DHET slash surface mass balance versus the ocean warming were aligned in the sense of one being, I, I feel like Bill kind of answered that question, but it's basically, are you when you did that sensitivity test with, with ocean warming, is it the case that the, the um, DHDT slash surface mass balance would align with the surface, with the ocean temperatures that you imposed? So if it's super warm, you might, you might have a lot of uh, precipitation and that might change. Like anytime if that, that the ocean was that warm, You'd have an influx of a lot more precipitation potentially. That's that's my aim. So I think I think I can actually uh, ask this question later. We can follow up on this later. But I was it's mostly about whether the the input that is that is from the that, that is you know surface mass balance and the input that is the ocean warming match up in any realistic way or whether it's just a sensitivity test. Um, I, I can. Oh, okay. I can. <laughs> <laughs> a difficult question indeed, but I mean, what, what I can tell is, is what, what Bill also, in the lines of what Bill just said, is that if we use this method, previously we, we, we worked with the ISMIP-6 parameterization of basal melt, so we had like a temperature correction, uh, a thermal forcing, and some term that, that you can correct on the cell-by-cell -cell or a basin basis. Mm -hmm. uh, and previously we, we needed quite a large correction in the, in the areas of the Amundsen Sea region, and if you add the ACT to it, it actually requires less. Uh, uh, of a correction in this in this area, so it actually comes closer towards the, the so that you don't need too much correction on your uh, World Ocean Atlas uh, IANS data set from the ISMIP six. Which I mean, it, it it tells me that it's like okay, this is we're adding something and the model is becoming more stable and has to compensate less. So that's nice, but I haven't given more thought about it actually about uh, uh, what it does to precipitation and what the consequences of it are. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Yeah, we, we can continue this conversation um, later this morning with a steam interest. Uh, let's move on with our next speaker, um, Tyler Pele, who's going to talk about ISMIP 6 and Tyler 2300 preliminary results. Uh, Tyler, can you share your screen? Would it work? Uh, yes. Right okay. here. Uh, it doesn't seem to allowing me to do I'm in problem. Did, did, did you send did you send your slides? I did, yeah. I sent my slides to um Elizabeth, I believe. Yes. All right then. Then let's use this plan B. I apologize everybody for the technical difficulties. All right, I'm gonna to have to do it this way. Go ahead, Tyler. Okay, no problem. Okay, great, yeah. Um, well, yeah, thank you all so much for having me today. Um, and so, yeah, my name is Tyler Pelly. Um, I'm a postdoc at Scripps Institution of Oceanography working in ice sheet modeling. And so today I'm gonna to be presenting the preliminary results from the ISMIP-6 Antarctica 2300 project. Um, and this is very much on behalf of the entire ISMIP science team. And so before I dive in, I just do want to note that the results that I'm going to share here today are very preliminary, um, and they're definitely subject to change over the next few months as we um, finalize our results. So uh, next slide, please. Right, great. Um, so the um, ice sheet model intercomparison project for CMIP-6 is the primary effort of CMIP-6 that focuses on the ice sheets. And so in the original ISMIP-6, 2100 project, um, main goal was to provide a process-based ensemble of projections of the Antarctic ice sheets contribution to sea level rise over the 21st century. And so individual ice sheet modeling groups are provided ocean and atmospheric enforcing data sets from select CMIP-5 and CMIP-6 climate models. And then we run simulations out through 2100. 
And so some of the primary findings were that um, the um, inland snowfall tended to compensate coastal dynamic ice mass losses. And so the sign of the sea level contribution um, by 2100 was a bit unclear. And so you can see that in the figure on the bottom left there where um, I mean sea level contribution by 2100, um, some simulations it's positive, some simulations it was negative. Um, in addition, there were a few glaciers that showed signs of dynamic change. Um, and so it's the figure on the bottom right here where you can see there's some um, ice, grounded ice thinning near Thwaites Glacier and um, also near Taunton and Moscow glaciers along the Eastern Arctic coast as well. Um, and so it was pretty clear from this project that um, improve, improved ice sheet model projections beyond the 21st century were needed. Um, the reason for this was because um, as we, the, the ocean warming was really starting to ramp up towards the end of the um, end of the 21st century. And this really did not leave a lot of time for the upstream glaciers to respond to um, ice shelf thinning. And so that's why we are really hoping to extend these projections further there. Uh, next slide. And so that's where this new effort comes in. And so here we're seeking to extend these pre previous ISMIP 6 projections through 2300 using the SEMIP 5 and SEMIP 6 climate models as before. And so the primary goals of this project are to help constrain the Antarctic contribution to global sea level rise through 2300, um, to assess the long term stability of different sectors of Antarctica, and then also to assess uncertainty from climate forcing and ice sheet models. Um, and on the bottom of that slide, I just want to note that um, there have been extended projections of the Antarctic ice sheet performed before, um, but real climate forcing was not used beyond 2100. And so, for instance, Gar Garbidal used cha step changes in ocean and surface air temperature, and Lowry et al. used repeated forcing after 2100. And so we thought that it'd be of really great interest to the community to explore the response of Antarctica to extended climate model forcing beyond the 21st century. Uh, next slide. Perfect. Um, right. And so for the Smith SIP project, we ran ice sheet model simulations that use extended forcing. And so that's forcing from climate models that were run all the way through 2300. We also used repeated forcing, so that's forcing after 2100. Um, that's comprised of randomly selecting forcing between 2080 and 2100, right? So we're just repeating that forcing randomly until we get to the end of the simulation. And we also ran simulations with and without ice shelf collapse. Um, so five um, global climate model forcings were used. So we used NORI-SM, CCSM-4, CESM-2, Wacom, had GEM2 and then UKESM. And so below on the bottom there are tables of the tier one and tier two experiments. And so in the presentation to come, I'm going to show results pertaining to these um, simulations in the red box here. And so these, these are the high emission simulations that use the extended climate forcing at 2300. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so on this slide here, we're showing the um, Antarctic ice sheet mass balance change in gigatons on the left y-axis and then millimeters of sea level equivalent ice mass on the right. And so, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, we, oh, sorry, this is the um, participating model. Sorry, I skipped the slide there in my mind. Um, and so there's 14 total, um, 14 total science groups that participated. Um, you can notice that some science groups show, some science groups um, per, uh, submitted many simulations. And so they're all in these, we included all simulations in the results to come. Um, I believe we had 10 different ice sheet models. And then of those ice sheet models, we had different ways of initializing the ice sheet models. So for instance, using data simulation or spin up, um, Models were initiated, initialized at different years and include different ice shelf melt rate parameterizations. And so there's a lot of differences within these ice sheet models that will um, comprise some of the uncertainty that we're gonna see um, coming up. But I did just wanna show the diversity of the groups that submitted to this international project. Okay. Uh, next slide. Yep. I'm sorry, this is the historical projection here. So now here I'm showing results from the um, historical and the control experiments. Um, so the historical experiments were run up to 2015 and started whenever the ice sheet model was initialized. And see so it's contained in this gray box here. And then the control experiment, which was run using constant climate forcing, is run from 2015 again out to 2300. Um, 
And so the main idea here is that um, a lot, some of the models lose mass, some of the models gain mass, um, but in general, this sea level response in the control experiment is real is low relative to what we're going to see in the transiently forced um, simulations to come. And so with this in mind, um, we previously made the decision that we are going to show sea level results without subtracting from the control experiment. And so what that means is that we're not going to correct the sea level um, sea level results for model drift. Um, and again, that's just because this control response is very, very small relative to what you're going to see in the slides to come. Um, but this is also a very active area of discussion right now in the group. Okay. Next slide. Okay. And so these are some of the sea level results um, for those four those four experiments that we showed. So on the top is CCSM4 force experiments, um, and then had GEM2. In the bottom, we have CESM2 and then UKESM. Um, and so in many of the simulations here, we see um, pretty stark ice mass response. Um, this is particularly true after 2100. Um, some of the high-end, most responsive models report losses of up to four meters of sea level rise ice equivalent by 2300. Um, you'll still notice that there are some models that tend to gain mass by the end of the simulations. Um, that's not much, not really the case for these last three experiments, but for CCSM4, this is true. Um, and the reason for that is because the surface mass balance um, in a lot of these other climate forcing models turned very negative towards the coast as runoff really dominated the signal, but this wasn't true in, um, in CCSM4. And so that's why you'll notice that there's still um, maybe about a third of the models are still gaining mass there. Uh, next slide. Um, and so here we're gonna show some bar plots of the sea level contribution to the Antarctic ice sheet um, at 2100, 2200, and then 2300 on the bottom. And so on the left ax on the left of each plot, we're showing uh, regional change for the Western Arctic ice sheet. The middle is the Eastern Arctic ice sheet. And on the right is the um, Antarctic Peninsula where the sea level change is given in millimeters, sea level rise equivalent ice mass. And so for 2100, there's also, please notice a different scale used for the Y axis there. Um, and so, a 2100 um, ice mass loss along the Western Arctic ice sheet was compensated by gains on the Eastern Arctic ice sheet. But you'll notice by 2200, this isn't the case anymore. Um, as for most climate model forcings, the contribution of the Eastern Arctic ice sheet changes sign. Um, and by 2300, we actually have a pretty significant contribution of the Eastern Arctic ice sheet to the overall sea level um, as well. Ice loss of the Western Arctic ice sheet still dominates the total signal by 2300. Um, it contributes about an average of 1.4 meters and up to 2.2 meters by 2300 to global sea level. And this really highlights that the spatial distribution of mass loss um, is not homogeneous across the Antarctic ice sheet. Okay. Uh, next slide. Perfect. Okay. So to look deeper into the spatial distribution, we plotted the ensemble mean ice thickness change in the units in units of meters in 2100 on the left, 2200 in the middle, and then 2300 on the right. So blue shading denotes where we have ice thickening and red shading denotes where the ice is thinning. And so on the bottom, we also are showing standard deviation in the ensemble ice thickness change um, at those same time steps in units of meters. So at 2100, as mentioned before, inland ice thickening um, along the interior of the Eastern Arctic ice sheet compensated coastal ice thinning. Um, but you also notice that this isn't the case in 2200 and 2300. So in particular, we see really strong coastal thinning signals um, on the glaciers draining the Amundsen Sea sector of the Western Arctic ice sheet. Um, also glaciers flowing into the Cycle Coast that drain into the Ross ice shelf, and then the ice streams feeding into the Filch Neroni ice shelves. Um, and in addition, we see um, some pretty dynamic thinning signals along the Eastern Arctic coast. So in particular around like Taunton, Moscow Glacier. So those glaciers in the Wilkes, on the Aurora subglacial basin, and also down in the Wilkes subglacial basin as well. Um, so these thinning signals propagate hundreds of kilometers upstream into the interior of the ice sheet. And so that help ex helps explain a little bit why Eastern Arctic flipped from a region of mass gain to mass loss by, um, by 2200. Uh, next slide, please. So here I'm just zooming into some of these mass balance, um, some of these thickness changes. Um, and so in general, we have the greatest thickness change is where we see the highest standard deviation in the ensemble, which is um, pretty standard. 
And so and this, this is really the case for Thwaites Glacier, but you'll notice that this is not the case for thinning along the Sipel Coast and along the southern flank of the Filch Neroni Ice Shelf. And so these are the areas that I have bubbled in yellow there. Um, so in those areas, thinning of over a kilometer are accompanied by low standard deviations relative to some of the other rapidly thinning regions. And so this highlights that there is much more model agreement or ensemble agreement, I'm sorry, um, that large scale thinning is gonna take place in those two areas by 2300. Uh, next slide. Perfect. Um, okay. And so in this figure here, so in each panel, we're showing the percentage of simulations on the ensemble that reported grounding line treat, retreat over a given area. And so where you see those deeper shades of red, that's gonna denote a higher percentage of the ensemble that retreated. Um, and then I also plotted in gray um, bed topography below sea level from Bed Machine Antarctica. And those bottom panels are just zoomed into the Western Arctic ice sheet from the corresponding panel above. And so at 2100, we see fairly limited retreat of the ensemble. And then if we fast forward to 2300, we see about 50% of the ensemble projects large scale retreat of Thwaites and Pine Island glaciers along the Western Arctic coast. Um, and about 40% of ensemble members um, actually project collapse of the, Ar the Western Arctic ice sheet, actually in those same areas that um, Tim was showing as well. So Thwaites and Pine Island, and then wrapping up to the uh, Roni ice shelf here, um, which is really, I found it really great that um, this, these were consistent. Okay. Um, and so in all, sim all simulations, also they project retreat of the ice streams feeding the Filch Neroni ice shelf. Um, and also like there is a pretty far inland, ex inland um, extent of the retreat along the um, Institute ice stream. Um, in addition, almost all ensemble members project widespread retreat of the glaciers along the Sipel coast. Um, so retreat in all these regions is occurring along bedrock that's grounded below sea level. So it's possible that there could be really fast retreat along retrograde bed slopes. Um, and so to look into this, we're gonna take some cross sections through Thwaites Glacier. And so it's gonna be the line going right through Thwaites and then also through um, the Institute Ice Stream. So it's gonna be the white line, the vertical oriented white line. And so we're gonna investigate the timing of grounding line retreat for the models forced with um, had GEM2. Uh, next slide. Perfect. So, in this figure, we plotted the position of the grounding line for each model forced with HADGEM2 for profiles along Thwaites Glacier. That's going to be the figure on the left, and then the Institute Ice Stream, which is on the right. So on the x-axis is the distance from the present day grounding line. And so zero is going to be the coast. And then as we move to the right, we're going to be moving inland. And then on the y-axis is the projection year. And so each point on that plot is a position of the grounding line in the model um, in a model submission. And the color of the marker corresponds to the submission. And so where you have the same colored mark markers oriented vertically, that means you had a stable grounding line position um, at, that, um, at that distance away from the grounding line, from the present day grounding line. And then when the same colored markers are oriented horizontally, that means you had really rapid grounding line retreat at that specific time. Um, and so we also, at the bottom of each panel, we plotted the bed topography, and then the ensemble standard deviation in bed topography is in the form of error bars there. And so for Thwaites on the left, we see that about half of the models have a large scale retreat initiated after 2100. And so it's notable that the rate of grounding line retreat of these models, and that's given by the slope of the different colored lines, is relatively similar. Um, so retreat ensues along retrograde bed topography and it's stabilized by a topographic high um, that's just about 400 kilometers away from the present day grounding line, right? That's gonna be that bump in the bed topography down there. Um, for the Institute Ice Stream, we see really remarkable ensemble agreement in terms of both the timing, magnitude, and the rate of the retreat. Um, so just before 2100, all but four models enter into a really rapid retreat over some retrograde bed topography, and the retreat stable. Um, yeah, and the retreat tends to stabilize on an upstream topographic high, but um, during that rapid retreat, um, the retreat rates averaged about 15 kilometers per year. Um, and this was pretty standard in most of the models that had that retreat. Um, and so this model agreement speaks to why the standard deviation and thinning in this region is so low, even though the changes in ice thickness were um, quite high. Okay. Um, next slide. This is a two minute one. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so for the, um, in terms of the conclusions, 
the um, Antarctic ice sheet had a large scale response to extended climate forcing through 2300. Um, the ice sheet lost up to four meters on um, the most responsive models because dynamic thinning outpaced inland increases in snow. Um, and the majority of this response occurred after 2150. However, there were still um, quite large uncertainties related to the choice of climate model forcing as well as the ice sheet model setup. Um, we also saw um, pretty large scale retreats near Quaid's Glacier, um, glaciers feeding the Roni and the Ross Ice Shelf as well. Um, and then one final note, I just, I know I mentioned this before, but I just want to say that these results are subject to change. They're quite preliminary. And so you might see um, down the road that they might look a little bit different if we get more model submissions. Um, next slide, please. And so if you'd like to have more information on the project, you can um, look at the wiki page and also feel free to email us at 6 at gmail.com. Um, and so I'd just like to acknowledge everyone that was involved in the project. It's spearheaded by Helen Sorosi at Dartmouth College and also um, William Lipscomb at UCAR, of course. And it's really a product of everyone that was involved with it. So um, yeah, thank you so much. And I'd be happy to field any questions. Thank you, Tyler. We have a we have, we have time for a couple of questions. If anybody has one. No questions? Not yet. <laughs> not yet? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of questions, but not yet. All right, then then I suggest we move to our next uh, talk. Let's see. I was missing in the chat. Good. So, Jan, um, so our next talk is going to be from, um, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your, your, your last name, uh, Sviltsek uh, Yerektsek. Do I get it close? Uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, I appreciate okay. the <laughs> could, could you correct me? How do you pronounce your last name? Uh, it would be Sviltsek Yerektsek. Um, but I mean, don't bother. It has been mispronounced, and uh, it doesn't matter too much. Thank you for your indulgence. <laughs> <laughs> so Jan is going to present us about uh, fast isostasy point G or regional two point five D model for accelerated computation of glacial isostatic adjustment. And uh, Jan, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Um, can you see my screen correctly? Yes. <clears throat> Fantastic. Um, so I work at the Complutense University of Madrid under the supervision of Marisa Montoya, Alex Robinson, and Jorge Alvarez Solas. And um, I mean, a lot of the work I'm doing is, uh, you know, um, I have their very good feedback, so uh, it's it's common work with them. Um, and yeah, I have to put the European flag on my presentations because that's uh, from whom I get my funding. Um, so today I'm going to talk about. Um, a model we came up with. Um, and I'll try to briefly introduce you a bit to the motivations for um, doing this. So I guess, you know, it's a secret for nobody in the audience that uh, ice sheets and solid earth interact quite a lot. Um, so we have very interesting processes that we're not going to look at today, like um, erosion and um, the basal heat flux that might be subject to changes of the solid earth. earth. Um, but today, yeah, we're going to look at the, the glacial isostatic, isostatic adjustment. Um, and in particular, um, a challenge that is uh, present in Antarctica, um, and in fact, in a, it's even more present in Antarctica than in any other place um, on the Earth, I guess, um, is the fact that we have a large lateral variability of the lithospheric thickness and the upper mantle viscosity. So for the first time, you can see it on the left plot, um, which is from work by Gomez et al. from 2018. Um, so we have differences from, let's say, uh, 40 kilometers up to uh, 280 kilometers. Um, that's the, the lithospheric thicknesses that we observe, um, or rather infer. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see the plot for um, the viscosity as estimated by uh, Ivins and co-authors. And you see that there is also a certain depth dependence, um, but you know, largely uh, a dependence on, let's say, X and Y, if we project that uh, on the Cartesian plane. 
And the magnitude of the difference is quite substantial. Um, in fact, we have um, as much as five orders of magnitude, uh, which might sound quite dramatic, but it's true also that the, the viscosity is kind of a, a log um, parameter. So yeah, but we, we do expect um, quite a substantial effect of having such a, a lateral variability. So <clears throat> when we look at uh, regional models um, that we use to to compute the glacial aesthetic rebound, um, I guess the most famous one among ice sheet modelers is the elastic lithosphere relaxed asthenosphere as uh, introduced by Lemurin and Hubrecht in 1996. And um, well, basically we have, um, we are solving this PTE uh, that is uh, largely governed by two parameters, uh, the asthenosphere density and the uh, lithospheric rigidity. And uh, when we solve that, we're going to then relax the solution uh, to have kind of a transient behavior um, by a relaxation time tau. So <clears throat> this model has been around for quite a while um, and has, I think, um, you know, served its purpose um, very well. Now, the problem is, um, how do you convert such a complicated map of the log viscosity into a, a map of the time scales? Uh, that's something that's absolutely not trivial to do. So um, someone, and I mean, some work by, oh, I cannot advance my presentation. No, it works, yeah. Um, so um, Bühler in 2006 came up with uh, this formulation of the problem, uh, which involves um, to, to directly put the viscosity into the equations. And that was based on previous work by Cathels, Lingle and Clark. And now we basically have a model that you know, can be physically parameterized um, by quantities that we are capable of inferring the, the viscosity. However, um, in the first place, at least, uh, it, we, it, it's not a model that allows us to have um, the lateral variability of these parameters being uh, embedded in the model. So um, there is some recent work uh, by Violaine Coulon and co-authors um, that is very exciting because I think it's making quite a large jump in the complexity of the model. Um, and the idea is uh, that in this elementary GIA model, we're going to have a much more complex equation for um, what would be in the LRA case, simply this uh, PDE that doesn't depend on time. And we're going to relax it um, again with such a relaxation time scale tau. Um, and I think the extremely nice add-on that was introduced there was to have a um, model for the geoid and to have, uh, therefore, also to be capable of approximating the, the local sea level. However, um, you can see that here again, we're using a relaxation time scale. And um, then, you know, we, or in the work they published in 2021, um, the um, field they would be using uh, looks roughly like this, which gets already much closer to having, you know, a, a reasonable spatial variability. Uh, but still doesn't get the exact picture, right? So the problem is we cannot simply um, ignore the fact that, um, sorry, uh, yeah, can, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah? okay, <laughs> sorry, I, I was disturbed by some messages. Um, so um, the, um, the lateral variability is not something we can simply um, ignore because, um, I mean, in fact, there is plenty of literature pointing out that um, there are some significant differences depending on whether you include this lateral variability or, um, or if you don't, right? So here's just like a, a small compilation I came up with. Um, you can see up to 13 papers that I have, um, you know, I've come across, came across, and uh, probably even more than only 13. Um, so, I mean, the idea would be simply to use 3D GIA models and run ensemble simulations. Um, and because, I mean, they're around, they're ready to use. But the problem here is that uh, the computation time make, makes this solution kind of intractable, maybe for some, some purposes. So you can see in the right hand side, um, there is work being done um, on this. And I think this is already like um, a quite amazing work by Caroline Van Kalkar. 
but it leads also to quite large computation time. So we felt like we might try to um, extend a bit this range of complexity for regional models. And so um, that's where fast isosity come, comes into play. And I've come up with this classification, which is, I mean, not standard. But if we have the LRA being the elastic lithosphere relaxed asthenosphere, we then go to the elastic lithosphere viscous asthenosphere, uh, mainly the work from Bueller and co-authors. Then the work by Violaine Coulomb would be a lateral variability uh, LRA model. And what we propose to do is do something like a lateral variability ELVA model, so um, allowing for taking viscosity maps directly. Now, to go into the description and the results of uh, what we've been doing, um, we are building um, uh, an N-layer model. So we're trying to um, embed the third dimension, although we only resolve for um, X and Y, which are projections, right, from um, the latitude and longitude. And uh, here you can get the the core of the idea. Um, so you can, and it is a formula provided by uh, Bühler in already uh, previous publications, how to um, get from the left picture, so from a lithosphere, then a viscous channel that is below, and a viscous half space that have different parameters, how you get to uh, an equivalent two-layer model. And this is essentially by scaling the um, uh, viscous half space viscosity by this factor here. So it looks quite scary, but it's essentially just an algebraic equation. And um, it allows you to um, go from a three layer model to an equivalent two layer model, which we are able to solve. Now, the idea is that by induction, if you have a three layer model that you can make into a two layer model, you can do the same with a four layer model and going into a three layer model, going into a two layer model. So um, that's a bit the idea that we applied and I didn't see it in the literature. It's um, nothing too crazy, but I think it allows already to have this depth dependence also being kind of implicitly in the model. And so that's why I claim it is a 2.5 dimensional model, right? Um, because we kind of have a, a slight resolution of this um, depth dimension. Now, how do the equations look like? Um, it's, if you want, um, something like a mix of the equations of Violaine Coulomb and Ed Bühler and co-authors. Um, and the idea is that um, we're going to allow, so a dependence of uh, eta, so the viscosity on x, y, and even t, uh, but let's not go into t too much in detail for now. And the same holds for the rigidity, although we're not going to put the time there. And um, this equation looks also a bit scary, um, but I think we came up with um, a, an interesting way of solving it, which is basically combine a finite difference method with a Fourier collocation method. And the latter uh, uses a fast Fourier transform, which allows us to, um, well, compute the solution relatively fast, as the name suggests, right? Um, but it also has an, a quite amazing property, and I think that's why also the fast Fourier transform is so revolutionary, or was uh, in its time, is because instead of having, um, if the data size or the, the number of variables is uh, n, then we do not scale with uh, n square as we increase the dimension, but rather with n log n, uh, which I think is very appealing to have um, low computation time and still quite high resolution. So um, now going into the test, um, we are basically reproducing the test that uh, Bühler and co-authors propose in their 2006 paper. And that's essentially putting um, a flat disk or a flat cylinder rather um, of ice. So the radius is 1000 kilometers, the thickness is one kilometer, and um, our domain is quite large. And we have here a set of parameters that are quite standard. And um, if we look at the solution, um, so on the top um, row, you have several timestamps of um, how the solution looks like. So especially at equilibrium, you can see here um, this slight four bulge that is quite characteristic of uh, models that are able to capture GIA in a slightly um, yeah, more accurate way, uh, which is not the case for LRA. And um, on the bottom left panel, you would see that the um, numeric and the analytic solution that is provided also in the work of Bühler are quite in accordance. Um, and that the error is decreasing basically with uh, increasing resolution. And in fact, um, if you go to the very end of that uh, picture, 
you see that um, we can have errors, mean errors that are um, below 0 0.1 meters. So I think that's very satisfying, uh, especially given the fact that even the maximum error is uh, below one meter. And now in terms of computation time, um, we tried also to um, do not promise simply you know, a, a fast algorithm and, and then <laughs> end up not having a fast algorithm. Um, so we also implemented the GPU version. If um, people are interested in using some um, quite adapted hardware to solving problems maybe in a bit efficient way sometimes. So you see that for a high resolution on the GPU, we only spent um, not much more than 100 second, seconds for uh, this 100,000 years uh, simulation. And even on the CPU, I mean, it's still um, quite acceptable, I would say, uh, because you don't spend much more than um, 1,000 seconds. So. Comparing things that do not compare, actually, um, briefly in the so in, in the work of Caroline van Kalikar, they have a coupling time step between the GIA model and the IC that is of uh, 500 years. We do not have any coupling, right? I'm just running that um, offline, my GIA model standalone. But I have a coupling time step of one year, essentially. Um, they have a simulation time that is roughly the same, and they use 16 CPU, uh, which already suggests that you know you have um, a cluster available. Um, to be honest, um, so I mean, that leads to a compu computation time of 37 days because you have to kind of um, also have a, an iterative coupling between the ice sheet and the GIA model. So you have um, yeah um, convergence of both histories basically. Um, now we didn't find the numbers uh, without the coupling to the ice sheet in the paper, but after talking with Caroline, uh, she was saying that a fair comparison would be uh, 15 hours of computation time. Um, but still, I think we can make the you know the fair point that fast isostasy is in fact quite fast because uh, we use a time step of one year, which kind of also avoids you or you know you don't need then to do um, such an iterative coupling that might be tedious. Um, because you have such a high time resolution, you don't need to make the ICE history and the GIA history converge. Um, now I did two other tests, test two and test three, uh, but it would be a bit too long, I guess, if I would show all of them. Um, test four is um, based on some uh, viscosity maps that I obtained from Douglas Fiennes um, that you can see here, basically. And that resembles quite a lot what we've seen uh, in the motivation of this presentation. And I'm picking two points, um, one of very high viscosity and one of very low viscosity. Um, and as you can see, it changes over depth. And after a certain depth, I simply have a constant field, right? And you see that the equiv equivalent half space viscosity that is computed by the N layer model is something like this. So it, it kind of um, changes quite the picture of, you know, when we see the leftmost picture, we might think, okay, these changes are absolutely insane. Um, maybe they're a bit less, right, uh, if you convert that into an equivalent half space because we have deeper layers that are uh, more viscous. Anyhow, um, the result of that is actually of, you know, pure interest. We're not trying to mimic any real behavior. Um, but you see that the blue curve is essentially the response of the point um, that has a low viscosity, while the orange curve is the point of high viscosity. And there you can see like the very different time scales they react on. And especially something I think that is also quite interesting and that might not be embedded in at least the ARA model is that you have um, an overshoot um, of the um, um, displacement that you will have at equilibrium for the low viscosity point. So that seems to be a, a behavior that uh, emerges from our equations. And, and it basically gives you kind of the idea of uh, what are actually the relaxation time scales between um, East Antarctica and West Antarctica. Uh, at least, you know, their extreme values. And here again, I just applied a disk as a, um, as a load. Um, but it might be quite unphysical. As you can see also from the field that arises, I'm applying a, a load that is a bit too large and I'm not far enough for the boundary condition for them to be perfectly held, but that's just an experiment for, you know, for curiosity, kind of. Um, if I did the same with a constant field, I guess nobody would be really surprised that they have uh, very similar time scales. And not exactly the same, because they're not at the same distance from um, the center of my grid, 
but um, that's just a sanity check kind of of the model. And then test five is uh, a deglaciation. This is a, this is a two minute one. Sorry? I have two more minutes. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm coming to an end, in fact. Uh, here you can see a deglaciation. Um, so on the left hand side, you have the ice thickness anomaly. In the center, you have the uplift rate, and you can see here that the glaciation is happening where you have uh, large values. And um, yeah, ultimately, what you can see is the, the viscous displacement and largely the uplift that results um, in the West Antarctic ice sheet. And um, yeah, so coming to, or, and here again, like the comparison of what I get as uplift rates um, with my model compared to uh, top row, some 3D GIA models, and bottom row. Uh, compared to some observations. So coming to some conclusions, um, I think maybe it's an overstatement, but I'm you know maybe willing to to be a bit disruptive. I think until I, maybe we have like the only regional model to fully account for the lateral variability of solid earth parameters. And I really try to put a lot of effort in testing the routines ex extensively. Um, I think it holds the promise of being fast, thanks mostly to the the fast Fourier transform. And I think we can also resolve the fast uplift rates, uh, sorry, the fast uplift that we can see in low viscosity regions and avoid some tedious coupling with, um, as it would be the case with the 3D GIA. So there is still some work to come. It is all work in progress. Uh, we want to um, mimic a bit the, the work of, um, of Coulomb et al. and also have um, a geoid equation and a sea level equation. Um, for now, I didn't speak really about the elastic response, but because it doesn't dominate, but we want to have like a better implementation of that. I'd also like to have some adaptive time stepping and allow the user to have uh, some higher order methods. For now, I'm just using um, an Euler method, but you know, going maybe to Rungakuta at least. Um, and you know, then when it will all be done, then we are willing to publish the model. And there will be a Julia version of it. That's the, everything I presented was uh, made in Julia. But there will be also hopefully a Fortran version, um, so that we kind of, you know, um, offer some solutions to maybe the transition time that we're um, having right now between um, languages like Julia and maybe other languages like Fortran that are still widely used. And so, yeah, thanks a lot for uh, listening to me. Thank you so much. We have time for one question before we move on to our last talk. Anyone? Not them. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, and last but not least, uh, to move on to uh, Kayfan Khan, who sh she's going to also talk about uh, GA model, uh, and more particularly a three dimensional fine element modeling for the relation resistance adjustment. So, Keshwan, can, can you share your screen? Yeah, maybe uh, I need to click. Oh, yeah. Screen Jan, can you, can you stop sharing your screen? Thank you. There it goes. You can't? Yeah, I cannot click the share your screen All button. Right. Uh, I, have your, I have your slides right here. Mm -hmm. Right. Would you like to come to my to my seat, or would you like me to advance your slides? Uh, it's okay. Yeah. Right. yeah no, it's Okay, thank you. 
you. Thank you for giving me this this chance to um, introduce my recent research on the 3D finite, finite element modeling for the global uh, glacial isostatic adjustment. I'm Christian. Uh, recently, I'm a postdoc in the University of Colorado Boulder. So in my talk, I will talk about the background of the GIL process, processes and the numerical modeling, how to solve this problem and share my results and my future works. Uh, so just a background, so how the GIA works. So it is a very dynamical inter interplay between the ice ocean and solid earth, as I showed in the right plot, when the mantle flow into the into the retreating ice sheet, it will cause not only the 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 um, solid earth uplift underneath the ice sheet. It also caused the um, sub subsidence around the peripheral weight around the ice sheet. And this is the deformational response. Include both the instantaneous elastic response, also the time dependent viscous deformation. Also, the uh, mass redistribution, both on the surface and the, in, the, in the Earth mantle, they will cause the perturbation of the gravitational field. This will feed back to drive the ocean water uh, movement. And, and in my model, I will include both the deformational and the gravitational, also another rotational uh, response for the whole dynamic system. And for the for the ice model, this is give us the, the model force. So I I will in my in my study I will use ICG. It's a global ice uh, ice height evolution model developed from the ice group. There are also other uh, options for both the global ice models and regional and regional ice models here. I should here, but I will focus on the ICG ice model. And another four things come from the associated uh, ocean uh, ocean surface variations. In, in, in my model, I will use the classical sea level equations developed by Ferro, I showed in the first here. Ferro, which will use to solve the gravitational self-consistent ocean. And also I will include both the shoreline migration, for example, I showed in the right, right plot here, there's shoreline migration when retreating ice, retreating, retreating ice occurred. Also the uh, ocean will influx in the regions of the retreating marine, marine ice sheet, as I showed in the left side. I will include all of those uh, <coughs> dynamic ocean loads in my, as my force to, to drive the uh, drive my equations of motion. Uh, besides the force related with ice and ice and ocean loads, another uh, factor for the GI problem is the earth matter viscosity structures, like what introduced in our last talk, very nice talk. So uh, most of the global GI model. They still they still use the one d one d or depth dependent viscosity because for this kind of viscosity structure there is a very good uh, analytic solution can be solved from the equations, but when we come to the more realistic Earth model we need to consider the lateral variations in the viscosity and another topic. Uh, it's still very controversial in GIS studies, but we need to consider, we need to, which need to be considered is um, the non Newtonian effects for GIA modeling. Based on some laboratory uh, results, both the linear and non linear logic can be occurring and maybe more uh, prevail in the uh, in the earth man, earth upper mantle condition, like I showed in the right frame here. 
And for my study, I will include both. In my study, I will only focus on the non-Newtonian facts can affect the GI response. But um, but our our tools, what I used here is the SIPCOM SVE. This is a software based on the finite element uh, numerical method, which is developed by my uh, PhD advisor, Professor Jun, in the past uh, 20 years and maintained and developed by our group members. Uh, what we used is the great hair I showed in the right, uh, right plot hair we used 12 caps to to derive the uh, to to derive the global to de derive this play, uh, sphere, sphere and then we use this special uh, mesh structure and then we can apply the massive parallel techniques to solve this problem so this will make our uh, computational speed is very high so for example we when we um, compute for linear for a linear model, and we uh, we use 500 years and cover from the last glacial maximum to present day, and we use uh, grades around uh, 50 kilometers uh, evenly evenly mesh and run this model, and then we can down global uh, we can get a global res resolution in five hours, and for non Newtonian neurology the we need a finer mesh. Also, we need a, a, a smaller time interval, like one, one like one year, and and this uh, is very very expensive for the computation. But our uh, software can solve this global problem for around around 20, 24 hours. And here I show some results for the. Uh, mental stress and viscous evolutions caused by the non neurology. And here I show during glaciation period, if we assume a linear, linearly ice build up history, and then the stress and the viscosity in the up mantle would be unchanged. But when a very rapid ice melting occurred, for example, around 14,000 years ago, and then the, and then the uh, rapid ice melting occur will induce significantly huge uh, stress in the upper mantle. And then because of the non-linear non neurology and the viscosity would be you know, reduced by around one, one order of magnitude, this would be a very fast relaxation phase. And then when this uh, process, ice melting process slows down, and then you can see the stress, ice-induced stress will decrease and then the viscosity also would gradually increase to their background stress. This indicates a very slow relaxation phase. Also, uh, uh, just a big picture how the uh, stress will distribute it globally in the different, different depths, for example, lithosphere, upper mantle, or lower mantle. And overall, we can see the stress induced. Uh, yeah, the loads induced stress, the distribution is very localized. Uh, underneath the loads, the stress would be very high. But if we uh, look at some, some regions far away from the ice sheet, for, for example, in the open ocean here, the stress would be very small. So this will give, uh, give us the idea that the non-Newtonian effects would be very important to the near, to the, yeah, to the, to the, to the region close to the ice sheet, but maybe it's not not very important for the far field. Also, how those uh, effects would affect the radix sea level predictions? I showed here both of near field and the far field model predictions from both linearology, which is solid solid line here show here, and our non-linearology predictions. So, so we can say. Uh, Around 14,000 years ago, so a uh, very rapid ice melting occurred. And then we can see our non linear uh, models will show a sooner and a more rapid, ma rapid sea level fall start and the uh, 
largest the difference between these two predictions can reach to around 30 meters. 30 meters. And we show a more rapid sea level fall, and then followed by a more rapid sea level, a, sea, yeah, a more rapid sea level fall. This this structure, yeah, this model structure from non-Newton neurology is very different from which we can get from the linear neurology. But when we come to the far field, we can say these two model predictions are identical. This is because the stress loads induced stress in the far field is very small. Uh, we also compare, the, compare our model predictions with some reduction level of observer, observer, uh, observations. We indeed find some um, very steep, very steep slope or some very rapid eye relative sea level fall from our data, which is very similar with what we found from our non newtonian neurology. And for our for, for my future works, so this is what I did in, in right now. So it's very uh, classical GIA modeling. So we have uh, forcing from ice and ocean, and we have the Earth structure, and then we can compute the GI uh, predictions based on those um, forcing and, 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 and Earth models. And then we can compare those model predictions to observ observables and to go back to uh, revisit our models. And another component I, I'm, I'm really very interested in and want to work on is how our uh, GIA model predictions, for example, the relative sea level change around the uh, ice sheet, how the uh, how the how the how the solid earth deformation can coupled with the uh, ice sheet evolution and then can affect our uh, ice sheet evolution history. So the uh, why the coupled is important, I think. In the previous talk, yeah, they just explain very, very good. Here, I just uh, show this show this picture for the far field ice melt. So the the far field ice melt will cause this local sea level rise. So this will uh, this will uh, make the grounding line retreat, and this will uh, affect the instability of the marine-based ice sheet. Also, if the near field ice melting occurred, the GIA response will be more localized. For example, they will cause the local sea level fall, and they will cause the uh, bedrock uh, topography, up, bedrock uplift. This, all of those can affect the condition where the marine ice sheet instability. So, so I'm really interested in the near field ice melting uh, in, in this case, and I want to see how the GIA response and the non-Newtonian effects can affect those uh, dynamic systems. So yeah, this is for my future work. And uh, and I just, I think I talk about this and uh, just to sum, sum up my talk here, I talk about the GIA-related uh, geophysical processes, include the deformational response, also the gravitational and rotational response. And our model is for global one. And uh, I also introduced some numerical models, what I used in my study for more complicated Earth structures. For example, include the 3D viscosity, also the non-Newtonian viscosity in these simulations. And for the future work, I'm really interested in the GIA and ice dynamic feedback with incorporating through the Earth structure. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to any questions and discussions on this topic. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Keshwin. Um, do does anybody have any question for Keshwin? Jan had to Jan had to leave, so um, come over. Any questions? Right, Heiko, go ahead. <laughs> Just waiting long enough. 
Um, yeah, very nice talk. Thanks. I was wondering, you mentioned at the end uh, that you're interested in the, the coupled feedbacks, let's say, between GIA and the ICE. Do you have a specific um, modeling setup in mind that you want to use, or, or are you thinking of looking at that more, let's say, in reconstructions or, yeah? Um. Now I'm still working. Uh, I'm still focused on the GIA part, so I'm still a very new uh, in the in the ice sheet dynamic modeling here, and I do have some ideas. So, uh, how can I use the GIA output? So, for example, the uh, from my model, I can simulate how the bedrock uh, bedrock uh, topography evolution with time. I can also output the regional. Uh, sea level variations around this, around the ice sheet. I can have this output. I'm really interested in if I have these two output and how to. Uh, I think these two output will be input for the uh, dynamic ice sheet modeling. So maybe some uh, boundary conditions can go go into that that part model. So this is my uh, ideas for the for this couple of things that still. And uh, still on the on the way to to this direction. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? <coughs> if not, so this was um, our la our last speaker for today. So thank you everybody for uh, presenting. Uh, I would just would like to open it up for some discussion. If anybody would like to um, discuss any topic or ask any question of the presenters that are still available. Um, and if there's no discussion at all happening, then we can just give everybody there you go. <laughs> I don't. I don't have a specific question, but I just wanted to say that uh, thanks for organizing this, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, all the talks, um, very nice. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank all the presenters because it came up. It came up very nicely. So um, it was very interesting. It was nice to see everybody again. Um, and I would say that so tomorrow there's going to be a joint session with the Polar Climate Working Group, where so the, fir the first part of the morning is going to be coming from uh, our land ice collaborators, um, same time starting at 9 a.m. Um, so, um, is it in here again? Or? Yes, it's in the demo room again. Okay. Um, I mean, and I'm also excited <laughs> to. To hear this present this talks, they're going to be great. Um, Heiko, I, I was going to say, following up in your last question, uh, I think the long term vision would be for CSM to have a solid earth sea level component, which would be a couple component with the other components. And, and so, um, the obviously, the solid earth and the ocean and the ice sheet are all closely coupled. And coupling those all together is, um, I would hate to take a guess as to how many person months that will take um, but but you know it's it's i, I enjoy having a long-term challenge and it's something kate is interested in as well a and and we are looking at kashwan's sitcom sv <laughs> models as a potential solid earth component um, it's global and it's 3d and it scales well um, so right off the bat that's um, things that are, that are not commonly found in in solid earth models um, one of the things I like about it is that the she, she showed a, a, a picture with the sphere broken up into 12 pieces. Um, and that's a <clears throat> it's a rhombic dodecahedron, uh, which is uh, it's not a platonic solid because um, the individual, the, the panels or the tiles are rhombuses rather than squares or triangles or pentagons. Uh, but I, I did not realize before before this, that you could tile a sphere with 12 identical rhombuses, rhombi, um, which is pretty cool for, for the point of view of decomposition if you're into stuff like that.
Yep, Simon. Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Um, actually, for Phil, this is going like way back into the beginning of the morning. Um, I know you had mentioned um, the spatial hydrology, like the synthesized hydrology that you're building into um, SISM. And I was curious if this. So, so this model is it planned? Are we planned on? Um, is it going to be a couple component in system, or is this used solely to initialize the um, the basal friction to get the effective pressure? Or like, can the effective pressure change as the ice starts to change in the future? Yes, the idea is this. This would be called once per time step. Okay, so, so, got so, it. So, so at some point during the time step, let's say you call your thermal solver and you get basal melting. At each grid cell, and and then you would call your your hydrology scheme, and that would give you your basal your diagnosed basal water depth, which would give you your effective pressure, which would be used in the velocity solving. Got it. Have, have, have you um if you're in simulations to see how the ice responds to the like is there a really high sensitivity to the changes in the effective pressure? Um. <clears throat> so so far. Um, when the scheme is run, as I described, it's it's pretty robust and it just makes the effective pressure look different from uh, other ways of computing effective pressure. And, and it gives you, as I was showing, a, a qualitatively a really nice velocity field. And when, when you look at magnitudes, you find that you, you tune it in some regions get better and other regions get worse is the, is the thing. Sorry, was there a last part to the question about the future or no oh i mean I, that pretty much was i think um i was curious like how some like if you've run like a transient simulation where the effective pressure is changing at every time step if you've noticed that the overbearing like the ice and the um like the velocity for instance like if it's very sensitive to changes in the effective pressure um i don't think i've run enough yet to stay to say that i'm still in the tuning and um well, maybe past the debugging stage, but in the tuning stage. Um, yeah, yeah, so so I don't think I could say definitively. But one, one, okay. thing I, yeah, one, thing, one thing I like about this is that, you know, when we're running simulations of the future, the ice sheet's always retreating. And so if you've inverted for all your basal parameters, it's just retreating over areas that you've already inverted for. But if you were running a simulation of the past when the ice sheet advanced, then you have the issue of what are your uh, basal friction parameters in regions that are newly occupied by an ice sheet. And uh, a, a scheme like this um, handles that very naturally and gracefully, unlike just, you know, if you just make, make up Coulomb C or, or, or some similar parameter based on uh, elevation or I don't know what. Awesome. Yeah, really, really wonderful work. It's really great to see um, how like the coupled nature of SISM come along. It's really fantastic. So thank you so much for um, for answering that. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, Tyler, I have a self-serving question for you. Um, could, could, did, did you guys receive our uh, in cost SISM submissions for SMIP 6? We did, yes. Um, yeah, yeah we're <laughs> definitely there. I know. Um, <laughs> I know I felt extremely disrespectful showing sea level results that didn't have. <laughs> well, well the, the issue <laughs> was have your guys. Issue was is that is that we or mostly I were late in getting the results in, so they didn't make the first batch of analysis. Yeah, they're definitely there though, um, and so in the like those spatial figures, um, I made those a little bit later. Um, and so those ones definitely included the SISM results, but we just couldn't see the individual um, lines on the plot, unfortunately. But we should get those up soon. I, I just wanted to check. No, no worries. <laughs> yeah. no, no, uh, we, we still owe you a five, by the way. But... <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, Mary, go ahead. So I have a couple of questions for Tyler and also one for Heiko. So now Heiko is going to answer. <laughs> uh, so for for Tyler, the, it's not a question, it's more an observation. So, um, so I was really, really curious about 
knowing more about the results of, about these preliminary results so the the very first question would be so this turning point from 2150 or turning point or break break point or let's call it acceleration change of what is going on um it, does it connect with the forcing directly and is it more the smb or more the ocean forcing and what's happening and is it happening at the same time in all of the four models any insights about that and the second question is that it seems that uh, what is first to like the, the hot spots or the first to to do something really um to retreat the most are in the Ross and Ron ice shelves and not in the Amundsen Sea. So the Amundsen Sea does, but later. So any comments about that? What's going on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so in terms of the, the first question, so relating that turning point in mass loss to the forcing. Um, yeah, so we in the so in the surface mass balance forcing, we really do see a shift. Um, kind of largely in that 2100 to 2150 area where runoff um, in a good amount of the climate models really starts to ramp up around the coast. And so the surface mass balance, it's a combination of precipitation and runoff mostly. Um, and so runoff at the coast really starts to be enhanced. And so we see negative surface mass balance at that time. And so that is um, really um, one of the driving forces there. And then we also, we see a similar response in the ocean forcing as well. Um, I have plots, I don't think I can share my screen, unfortunately, but um, I could maybe send something afterwards, but it shows that um, like subshelf melt in the ensemble ramps up after about 2100 to 2150 as well. Um, so it really is a combination of the surface mass balance turning negative and then ramping up the ocean forcing as well. So, uh, Tyler, on, on on your little toolbar, do you see a do you see a square with a arrow pointing out because that's the sharing screen button? If you read, I do. Yep. Um, so, in theory, you should be able to share your screen if you want to show something. Yeah, just here. Let me, I think it has has me go in um, system preferences for some reason. Okay, never mind then. Sorry. Oh, that, no, it's it's probably um an error on my end that's okay it's um it would just be like some line plots it's not nothing super super convincing <laughs> um and then and the second question so the second question is relating to the retreat so why we see retreat of the um, amundsen sector a little bit later than we do um like the cycle coast and institute and i it would take a little more looking into. I, I don't think it's necessarily to do with the forcing. I think that would be more related to the fact that like, the ice in those areas are much closer to hydrostatic equilibrium. So I think that it would take a little much less nudging of those sections to initialize retreat. Whereas that's that might not be the case, um, for instance, in Thwaites. I think Thwaites is going to take more nudging to get a much larger response. But those areas, since they're so close to flotation already, just need a little bit of ocean forcing and then um, in all the models they go. Um, and then in addition, like the bed topography in those two regions is also much smoother. Um, that could be, be just because we don't have as many ice thickness observations over there as we do near Thwaites, but um, because the bed's a little smoother, it also is more, um, more, it's, the grounding line retreats more readily in those locations. Yeah. Okay. That would be my intuition, but yeah, I think it would probably take a little bit more analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And as for the question for Heiko is, what about Antarctica are there, uh, for uh, Greenland, sorry. So are there plans to uh, to extend to 2300 or what? what's the plan? Yeah, so I mean, we've been discussing this for a while, and uh, I think I finally s gave a clear sign that I would be willing to lead it. Um, but we have to decide that in the steering committee, if we do that, uh, there are some concerns that, that I can repeat here, which is that um, 
while for Antarctica you may still have more or less the same ice grounded ice area even you know far into the experiment uh, for Greenland that changes much more rapidly and so there's this concern whether the surface mass balance that we produce is uh, still valid for a much reduced ice sheet geometry that's that's one of the concerns and um yeah and then the question as always is um you know is it worth it to make this experiment with a lot of ice sheet models do you really gain a lot of insight into the problem by that or is it not something you can do with less with fewer models so th that's something we have to consider because we don't want to overload the modelers either there's a lot of people that do both ice sheets and um, we have to kind of keep the pipeline open for for other experiments as well that are coming up so yeah okay. but uh, it yeah. looks Thanks like there could, it looks like there could be a greenland extension along the lines i mean the great thing is if we do greenland we have all the ground covered already um in experimental setup and so on from antarctica we learn a lot from that so that we that we could All right. Anything else that anybody would like to add? Uh, if not, then uh, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us. Um, hopefully, see you tomorrow morning. And let's, uh, I would just like to uh, just remind everybody that we are having our uh, summer workshop uh, the week of June 12th. Um, 2023 from, from June 12th to June 15th. Um, I think it's going to be hybrid again uh, here in Boulder. Um, we'd love to see you in person if you can or well, in the virtual space otherwise. And um, otherwise, see you tomorrow, hopefully, and have a great lunch. It was, uh, thank you for attending and presenting to us. Thank you so much. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. I'm going to stop the recording. I'm just going to leave the meeting. So, it's a bit